Good afternoon, uh, WDM, uh, Tim of the RSC. Good morning to those joining us in the UK. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome you to our forum and the role of universities in the international climate change debate. This forum is organised by the Culture and Education Section of the British Embassy in Moscow, together with the Climate and Science and Innovation Section of the Embassy. The forum is part of our University Alliance programme, which creates a platform for dialogue between UK and Russian universities. Uh, my name is Tom Heaps. I'm the Climate Change and COP26 lead in the British Embassy in Moscow. I'm delighted to be taking part in today's event on such an important topic. Climate change is the biggest challenge facing us all in the 21st century. This year in particular will be crucial. COP26 in Glasgow in November will be a pivotal moment for the world to come together and agree ambitious steps to prevent the catastrophic warming of our planet. To be on track to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement, every country needs to agree uh, needs to increase its commitment to reducing emissions and to aim for carbon neutrality by the middle of the century. To achieve these targets, we need the evidence and expertise provided by universities around the world to guide us. So I'm excited to hear from esteemed panellists about the role universities play in the climate discussion. Before we start, there are a few points of housekeeping. Our forum is run in Russian and English with synchronised translation. You should be able to find the interpretation button on your Zoom screen and select the English language channel. Make sure you're using the Zoom application and not the browser version, as some functionality may be limited. Our forum is going to be uh, conducted both in English and in Russian, and the interpretation is available. Uh, please make sure that you have selected uh, the uh, right channel to do that. At the bottom of the screen, please click on the interpretation uh, icon uh, and select the relevant language. Please uh, recommend we are supposed about the fact that uh, we recommend that you should use the Zoom application because the uh, web-based version uh, does not offer simultaneous interpretation functionality. Today's forum will consist of three sessions examining different aspects of the role of universities in the climate change debate. In each session, we will hear from each of the panelists in turn before a discussion based on our speakers' presentations and questions from the audience. If you have questions for the panelists, please use the Q and A button. We will try to answer as many of them as possible, but if we don't manage to get through them, we will publish a Q&A after the event on the project website. At the end of the forum, you will receive a link to a short survey. We would be grateful if you could please spend a couple of minutes filling it out, as it will help us shape our future programmes. Right, that's the, the housekeeping done. And uh, without uh, further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce our first, uh, our first session, um, which is focused on university and their contribution to local, national and global strategic responses to climate change. We have uh, three speakers, uh, Dr. Georgi Sofonov, uh, Associate professor, professor of the Department of World Economy, Director of the Center for Environmental and Natural Resources Economics and at the National Research University of Higher School of Economics. Professor Sergei uh, Bobilov, uh, Head of the Environmental Economic Department of Economics Faculty, Head of the Center for Bioeconomics and Eco Innovation at Lomonosov Moscow State University. And Professor Liz Price, Professor of Environmental Education and Head of Department of Natural Sciences at Manchester Metropolitan University. I'll hand over now to uh, Dr. Georgi Safonov to give the first presentation. Good morning and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to uh, address this audience and provide you with a brief overview of the efforts undertaken by the Higher School of Economics in terms of uh, studying the economic, uh, economics of the climate change and sustainable development. Let me share my PPT stack with you. I have prepared a couple of uh, slides for you and I really hope that you can see my stack on your screens. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to point out that I will focus on two work streams pursued by the Higher School of Economics. The first one is the academic projects, uh, uh, so, sorry, the research projects uh, focusing on climate uh, change. By the way, the climate change research was embarked on by the Higher School of Economics back in the uh, mid-1990s. In 1996, uh, we have uh, set up uh, the Center for Economics of the Natural Resources and Environment, and, environment. and we have uh, established a very professional team of scientists who started looking into a wide range of various aspects, one of them being uh, the climate change. 
uh, and we have stepped up our efforts uh, starting from 1998 when uh, for the first time uh, we uh, launched a very interesting uh, joint research in Russia. Uh, we partnered up uh, with, uh, the, uh, with, a, with our US counterparts to try and test uh, the new guidelines uh, on uh, uh, taking stock of the carbon emissions. So this, uh, this was the first experience at a level of uh, regions, uh, separate enterprises. So there were a couple of pilot regions so that we tried to cover. And then we started expanding our efforts to cover an ever increasing number of Russian regions. Starting from the year of 2000, we have actively embarked on uh, involving uh, large corporations, including uh, then a largest monopoly in Russia, uh, we, uh, which is Rao AS. Uh, it, it was the energy company. Actually, power generation uh, uh, was something that it was responsible for. They uh, accounted for the carbon emissions and uh, a team of experts, including those from the higher school of economics, took part in uh, uh, in uh, taking inventory of the uh, greenhouse gas uh, greenhouse gas emissions, others uh, other industries uh, took part in that. That included uh, oil and gas, uh, uh, such companies as Gazprom, and so on and so forth. And we uh, helped them shape their corporate strategies on uh, curbing carbon emissions. We published uh, an article uh, in the Springer uh, Journal, and by the way, we also delivered a report at various international fora. Starting from the year of 1999, uh, I personally uh, ha have been taking part in various climate change debates. Actually, I have attended every single conference since then. And oftentimes uh, I uh, took part in the COP uh, conferences. Uh, uh, the same holds true for uh, my counterparts. Another important work stream is providing analytical support. And by that, we mean both providing support to the Russian delegation, which takes, parts in the, takes part in the COP uh, conferences, as well as preparing the ratification of the Kyoto Protocol. It was a very complicated process back in 2003 and 2004. We published a paper uh, which was co-authored uh, uh, by counterparts from the Moscow State University and other colleges. And actually, uh, I believe that our efforts uh, proved uh, to the Russian government the necessity to ratify the Kyoto Protocol, and ultimately uh, Russia became signatory to the Kyoto Protocol. We have also done much uh, to uh, prepare the ratification of the Paris Agreement. Uh, that was uh, before the COP21 held in Paris in 2015. And uh, even after that, we also embarked on uh, a very long journey. This is a list of uh, some of the most interesting projects that we have pursued recently. Uh, of course, this is not an exhaustive list, but uh, this is an initiative. The first bullet is the initiative of the, the then uh, UN Sec Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Uh, uh, well, uh, the, as the title says, it's uh, a deep decarbonization pathway project, uh, DDPP for short, and this project became a real milestone because the outcomes of the projects uh, were used to prepare for the COP21 and uh, approving uh, the uh, Paris Conference. Another important project pursued from 2015 until 2020 uh, was something that HSC also took part in jointly with uh, 27 international organizations. Uh, uh, it was uh, done uh, within the framework of the EU Horizon 2020 uh, program. The outcomes were quite positive uh, and uh, we uh, looked into various pathways of economy development uh, at the global stage at, and at the national stage, especially uh, given the fact that uh, deep decarbonization and carbon neutrality uh, were uh, given the priority back then. It was uh, added and complemented by the COMMIT uh, project. It was a short-term uh, project pursued within the framework of the EU European uh, program. Uh, low carbon uh, and sustainable development were the primary uh, focuses. Uh, and back in 2019, we initiated, sorry, we uh, started taking part in uh, another project uh, within the framework of the Horizon 2020 program. Uh, it is titled engage and uh, we plan to look into not just into new pathways and new decarbonization strategies, but also we will, we will be studying the role of uh, the so-called disruptive technologies 
in other words, technologies that actually uh, change the playground and the ground rules in the market. For instance, uh, I'm talking about such technologies as AI in the energy industry and other industries as well. Higher school of economics also uh, takes part uh, in uh, the recently initiated series of scientific uh, workshops on modeling the low carbon development. Well, uh, the organizer is uh, the uh, center of energy of the Moscow-based uh, 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 Skolkovo uh, School of Management jointly with the EU office in Russia. And the most recent project uh, that we uh, started pursuing in November 2020 uh, is focusing on uh, establishing a world-class scientific center in Russia. And uh, I'm going to be ahead of a department which will focus on modeling the links between social and uh, natural uh, or environmental systems. So uh, this is uh, a project that we're going to be pursuing in the next five years. We have also joined last year uh, to uh, the uh, International Integrated Assessment Modeling Consortium uh, IAMC for short. It, it includes over 60 international organizations which are flagship uh, experts on modeling. In terms of academic and educational projects, uh, I cannot but uh, recall that about two decades ago, uh, uh, we have received uh, the first uh, grant from FCO jointly with the University of Bath, and we have developed a unique uh, training course on economics of uh, the natural resources. It was an introductory course, uh, Economics 101. Uh, uh, well, I guess uh, uh, Professor Bobulov would correct me uh, if I say something wrong, but I still believe that uh, this course is still relevant and we use it in our uh, curriculum. Another important course that we developed jointly with uh, the U.S. Uh, Environmental Defense Fund and NGO focused on uh, market-based uh, environmental management uh, techniques. We also developed uh, an environmental management uh, course based on the uh, risk assessment methodology. Uh, we assessed uh, the risks of uh, pollution and its impact on uh, the uh, healthcare. Uh, this is another unique and relevant course. Another uh, recent course that we have developed is titled Sustainable Development, and uh, uh, we have developed it jointly with the Moscow-based uh, University of Foreign Relations. In addition to a number of educational uh, pr programs, we develop various training programs focusing on several work streams linked to the climate change. And uh, these training uh, programs are offered not just in Russia, but in foreign countries as well. Kazakhstan is a good example. In 2019 and 2020, we have we, we implemented another project funded by an FCO uh, grant jointly with the British Embassy. It's uh, an educational program on the economics of climate change that we pursue jointly with the Russian State uh, uh, Agricultural University and the Moscow State University. As for the upcoming uh, steps that what we plan to take. By the way, uh, the global energy. Uh, 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 transition of the uh, green innovations economics are two uh, courses that we that we are offering right now. We have set up the first climate change uh, scientific lab in Russia. A new faculty uh, started operating. Uh, uh, it is uh, uh, it focuses on the global climate changes. We offer a strategic management in the energy industry. Um, uh, master's program. A number of uh, other projects are pursued jointly with the undergrads, and uh, I act as a supervisor. We try to involve uh, postgrads uh, uh, to this, in this program as well. We also offer our undergrads and uh, postgrads an opportunity to take part in various international programs and uh, summer schools. For instance, a couple of uh, students uh, uh, were uh, seconded to the U.S., uh, and uh, uh, we, we plan to uh, organize a summer school of this year for both undergrads and postgrads is going to be carried out in Austria uh, at the International Institute of Applied Systems Analysis. We also take part in uh, various uh, training programs offered by the International Energy Agency. And this is my last slide. These are the uh, steps that we uh, plan to undertake in the near future. We, we plan to develop a minor uh, on the economics of climate change at the HSC. Uh, we have a total of four uh, 
campuses uh, based in St. Pete, uh, Nizhny Novgorod and Perm, as well as in Moscow. And all these training courses are offered to uh, everyone. So these are open courses. Uh, a master's program is something that we plan to develop on uh, the climate change economics. Uh, we also take part in uh, the work under uh, undertaken by the BRICS Network University. We have established close co cooperation with the universities from uh, the BRICS uh, member states. And two more work streams that we plan to uh, undertake in 2021. A joint program with the Sakhalin-based university because Sakhalin has, has been uh, selected as a pilot uh, project uh, to test uh, carbon management techniques. And uh, vice prime minister uh, of the Russian government signed uh, the relevant uh, decree. And we also plan to collaborate with the Altai State uh, University of Technology because Altai is gonna be a pilot uh, region on adaptation. These are the colleges and universities that we plan to establish closer uh, collaboration in the fields. As for the major outcomes, I believe Russia- Sorry, uh, Dr. Stefano, can I, uh, I ask you to uh, wrap up in 30 seconds, please. Sorry. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, I'll do that. Uh, like I said, uh, Russia has, be uh, has become a signatory both to the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement. As for the DDP project, uh, uh, Article 4.19 of the Paris Agreement tasks us with developing low carbon, uh, high growth economy strategies. As for links and co uh, commit projects, we have developed a number of uh, pathways that are being used by uh, both the IPCC uh, and uh, the national governments. I believe that several thousand experts uh, have been trained under our programs. Thank you so much for your attention. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to entertain them. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Safonov. Um, looking forward to discussing that uh, in detail, but uh, for now, I'll hand straight over to uh, Professor uh, Bobilov uh, to take us through his presentation. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First and foremost, I'd like uh, to thank the organizers of this online uh, forum. I believe uh, Climate change education is uh, quite a, a new topic, both at the global level and for Russia, uh, it's a brand new uh, work stream. And uh, uh, Professor Safonov uh, already mentioned that uh, HEC uh, is heavily engaged in this particular work stream. However, uh, the Moscow State University uh, has been involved in this work for uh, I guess uh, a longer period of time. When preparing for this online forum, I could not help but recall this particular textbook, which was probably the first one to be published in Russia. I co-authored this te textbook with uh, uh, Mr. Grzevich, uh, who unfortunately passed away. Uh, it is called Global Climate Change and Economic Development. In other words, it was uh, a project uh, carried out by the uh, uh, World uh, Wide Love Fund and uh, UNEP. It was published back in 2005 in Moscow. So I looked through this textbook and actually the main bullets of this textbook, despite the fact that it was written uh, 15 years ago, are still relevant because uh, we're talking about the uh, losses and benefits uh, and the consequences of the climate change in general, the links between the climate change and economic development, external factors that have an impact on economic development and climate change and so on and so forth. In other words, a number of issues raised in this textbook are still relevant. The Moscow State University, just like the Higher School of Economics, does not offer a a training course on climate change per se. However, uh, we, uh, and I'll be talking about that later on, we offer a number of other uh, training that uh, we decided to integrate into the curriculum and they focus on uh, the sustainable development and the green economy. The green economy center, sorry, is uh, shown in the uh, bubble in the center uh, and it is surrounded by other smaller bubbles uh, such as a low carbon economy, circular economy, uh, blue economy and so on and so forth. As part of the uh, low carbon uh, economy uh, training course, we try to drive the message home uh, on the major issues uh, 
of the climate change to both uh, master's uh, degree students, bachelor uh, program students, and so on and so forth. This slide uh, lists a number of training courses which we offer uh, at our faculty and at the, the university uh, in general. For instance, the biology faculty of the Moscow State University, the uh, faculty of geology also offer a number of uh, uh, courses uh, focusing on the economics of sustainable development, uh, environmental economics, uh, the green economy uh, training course, uh, which is offered jointly with the law school of the Moscow State University. The energy markets is quite a broad, uh, uh, broad uh, range course that we offer. So uh, these training courses uh, help us to heavily engage in studying uh, the uh, climate change uh, economics. Oh, we uh, published the first paper in Russia uh, uh, devoted to uh, the Sustainable Development Goals. It is called Green Economy and the Sustainable Development Goals. Our, uh, our department uh, has celebrated its 40th uh, anniversary. Uh, it is considered to be a young department uh, by uh, Moscow State University standards. But nevertheless, like I said, this paper is devoted to the Sustainable Development Goals quite a number of educational and academic uh, programs that we offer are closely linked with the sustainable development goals. In particular, we uh, honed in uh, on uh, the uh, SDG 13 and its uh, role, uh, links with other uh, SDGs. Uh, I'm not going to list all of them, of course. Some of them are purely economic, some of them are social, and some of them are environmental. That holds true for SDG 15, uh, which uh, is uh, uh, called Life on Land. So this is part and parcel of, of our training courses. Uh, I just wanted to uh, demonstrate the link uh, between our courses and SDGs. For us, uh, the three main bullets uh, are relevant as far as the climate change economics are concerned. First and foremost, uh, that is uh, the adequate assessment of the natural resources or, or natural assets. Uh, and uh, the, the, the rule that we are guided by is that if uh, something does not have a price tag, it's not taken into account in the decision-making process. Of course, we're talking about the carbon emissions, carbon emission uh, uh, price tag. Uh, and uh, uh, we also uh, focus on external factors. In other words, uh, we are still bad at calculating the environmental uh, impact and environmental damage caused by the climate change. And in the past two years, we've uh, started focusing on the health issues, uh, you know, uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic and so on and so forth. And uh, another important issue, which is closely linked with the uh, climate uh, change is that uh, at least in uh, Russia, uh, uh, the economic uh, damage amounts to at least 15% of the national GDP. Uh, so uh, assessing the impact of the external factors is uh, really important. And last but not least, uh, we have to take into account the time frame factor. The uh, discount uh, tyranny problem is well known. And if we uh, make our decision decisions based on the discounts offered in the traditional economy, all the climate change projects uh, will definitely make no sense in terms of economics. So we have to find a way out of this trap. Another important uh, issue that we face is monetizing our course. Of course, uh, uh, we are studying economics and economic so solutions uh, to the climate change problem and the low carbon economy problem. Of course, uh, we have to make it uh, part of the econo economy mainstream uh, and uh, part of the global economy transformation process. Of course, we uh, discuss uh, things like uh, sustainable development uh, indicators, uh, uh, the cost efficiency ratio and the trap already mentioned. Uh, benefits and costs uh, of uh, decarbonizing the economy. And of course, uh, we are guided by the best practices uh, uh, developed by the World Bank, the UN and the OECD. Uh, I, we're trying to demonstrate that uh, if something is environmentally friendly, it makes sense in, ter in terms of economics. It's economically expedient. And uh, to wrap up, uh, it's worth mentioning that we take part in a number of educational uh, programs, uh, such as the VUZ uh, Echo Fest. Uh, it's uh, an event uh, attended uh, 
by quite a number of colleges. Unfortunately, back in 2020, we were unable to uh, carry, carry it out, organize it face in a face-to-face -face, uh, format, but otherwise it is attended by over 70 uh, Russian universities, including the uh, Moscow State University, the Higher School of Economics, uh, uh, the Association of the so-called Green uh, Universities uh, uh, of Russia. Uh, the MIFI University uh, also takes an active part in it. In other words, it's an attempt to involve both the undergrads and universities uh, as part of the uh, WUS Echo Fest festival. Uh, it is aimed at discussing climate change problems. By the way, I decided against uh, 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 providing you with a separate slide on that because Gergi already mentioned that, but we offer a practical uh, course uh, jointly with the Higher School of Economics. Andrei Stetenko, uh, a professor at our department, uh, takes part in uh, planting trees in the Altai territory, and this program has been pursued for a decade now. So basically, uh, we've been discussing various practical issues such as certification, quota selling, carbon uh, management mechanisms, and so on and so forth. In other words, it's another important uh, forum that uh, our professors take part in. We uh, actively take part in uh, the summer schools uh, carried out by the Green University. So this is my alma mater. This is a statue of the, uh, of, uh, devoted to Lomonosov, the founder of the Moscow State University. And in conclusion, uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, show you uh, these two booklets on sustainable, sustainable development of colleges. Uh, the first one is called Five Steps uh, Towards uh, Being a Green University. You can find them online. Please uh, read them carefully and use them uh, uh, in your uh, training process. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, that's really interesting. And I mean, the, the, the scale of the, uh, the, uh, the economic damage caused by uh, 15% of GDP is, is huge. And I think it kind of uh, demonstrates exactly why uh, this is such a vital issue. Uh, I look forward to the questions, remind the audience to uh, submit questions through the, uh, the Q&A button um, and we'll uh, put them to the panelists at the end. Uh, but for now, I'll hand over to uh, Professor Liz Price uh, for her presentation. Thank you. Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be meeting with you today. I'm just going to share my screen and uh, hopefully you'll be able to see my presentation. Just wait for that to share. I hope you can see that okay. Let me just move the view to... So thank you very much. So what I'm going to be talking about today is the contribution of Manchester Metropolitan University to strategies in response to climate change. And we have an ambitious uh, vision to be a leading sustainable university contributing to the world's agenda for sustainable development. And in this presentation, I'm going to outline the broad context of what Manchester Metropolitan University does in relation to sustainability strategies and climate change challenges across teaching, research and partnerships. Um, and I'm going to give an example of each to give you a little bit more of a flavour of what we do. But I'm also going to include our contribution to Manchester strategy. So our success as a university in sustainability has been recognised through a number of measures, including the People and Planet University League, the Green Gown Awards, and also ISO 14001 accreditation. And all these demonstrate a clear commitment to managing and improving our environmental performance. In relation to teaching, um, we are working to promote education for sustainable development aligned to the sustainable development goals as, as previous speakers have highlighted across our university to embed it in all our programmes, regardless of discipline. And we have been a National Union of Students Responsible Futures accredited institution since 2015 in recognition of this. We're also very proud to be recognised as a member of United Nations Academic Impact um, in recognition that we promote United Nations Academic Impact principles, and these include sustainability through education. 
And one of our education for sustainable development initiatives is carbon literacy. And we have delivered carbon literacy training to students and staff since 2012. I want to tell you a little bit more about carbon literacy. Um, the carbon literacy project training develops skills and knowledge for climate action and carbon reduction. And it's been recognized by the United Nations as one of the 100 worldwide transformative action programs. Now Manchester Met have pioneered the use of students. You can see some of them on the slide here as carbon literacy trainers and facilitators through a Green Gown Award winning carbon literacy for staff and students model. And we're really pleased that our model, the Manchester Met course is now shared with all UK universities by the Carbon Literacy Project as part of their UK government funded public sector carbon literacy toolkit. And if colleagues are interested in how we might uh, work together to broaden that, we would be delighted to speak to you. In terms of our research, we have a range of research expertise to address climate change challenges. And I'm just going to highlight some of these now. So for instance, we have a hydrogen fuel cell innovation center driving forward hydrogen technology. We are leaders in aviation and climate research. And we also have strong research in carbon storage in a range of environments across the globe. Our research focuses on adaptation and resilience um, in response to climate change. And this includes green and blue infrastructure in cities, planning and action for the city of Manchester and the region, but also coastal managed realignment. We do a great deal of work on responses to climate change in a range of environments. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute. But we also do work on circular economy and print city. And so for example, our circular economy work transforms waste plastic into 3D printed products and even waste concrete into 3D printed furniture. We work very closely on smart infrastructure initiatives and we have established one of the largest knowledge driven low carbon districts in Europe through our work on smart infrastructure. What I'd like to tell you a little bit more about now, though, is our Arctic research, which hopefully will be of, of primary interest to colleagues on the call. Um, our environmental change research group studies natural and anthropogenic drivers of environmental change and the future impacts of these on our planet. And I'd like to introduce you to a number of early career researchers who work in this area. And these include Dr. Catherine Adamson, who works on impacts of climate change on glacial environments in Greenland, Norway and Iceland. Dr. Yestin Barr, who works on impact of past and future climate warming on glaciers and volcanoes, including in the Russian Arctic. And Dr. Robert Sparks, who works, among other things, on carbonaceous material export from permafrost in Siberia. And I know they would be delighted to collaborate on any initiatives that may result from this meeting. We're also delighted that one of our PhD students, Solia, who works with Rob Sparks on soil development in post-glacial landscapes, will be presenting later in the session. And then finally, I'd like to highlight some of the partnership and collective action work that we undertake, because as we all know, collective action is crucial to tackle climate change challenges. And we work with a number of partners, both internationally nationally and regionally as we look towards COP26 and beyond. So internationally, these include the Inter-University Sustainable Development Research Programme, which we host at Manchester Met in collaboration with partners in Hamburg. And this is a global network of researchers which has 140 university members worldwide, including two in Russia. We work with the Parliamentary Group for Renewable and Sustainable Energy, particularly in relation to our work on hydrogen fuel cell. And we're members of the Climate Commission for UK and Further Higher Education in developing a toolkit for climate action for higher education. We work closely with the Advisory Board to Sustainable Aviation. And we're key members of the Manchester Climate Change Partnership, working very closely with them to achieve Manchester's ambition to be zero carbon by 2038. And we as a university have committed to be zero carbon 
by uh, 2038 and we have a proven carbon management plan that will allow us to achieve that. Um, I'd like to just focus on one particular example of work we do uh, regionally and locally in the Northwest, and that's our support for the Net Zero Northwest initiative. So the Net Zero Northwest initiative is um, an initiative to tackle climate change balanced with the skills for a green economy. It aims to be the UK's first low carbon industrial cluster by 2030. And Manchester Met's role in this is to lead the skills element of the work of the Net Zero Northwest Industrial Cluster, working with partners across the region, including uh, Greater Manchester Combined Authority Challenge Groups, Manchester City Council Zero Carbon Skills Groups, and Northwest Universities, Further Education Colleges and employers across the region. And we are leading the technical skills group to deliver training and a, and a track record for, for people to develop their skills between now and 2030. So I hope I've given you a very brief oversight of the activities that we do and hopefully you can see that we have a very integrated vision of teaching, research and partnerships to develop uh, researchers and graduates who have the sustainability skills and capabilities necessary to address uh, climate change challenges. So thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to any questions you may have at the end of the session. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, I think uh, that was really interesting to hear about the range of partnerships uh, that you have going, um, and also the, uh, the the project Net Zero Northwest sounds fascinating. And, I, uh, and naturally, I really support the uh, the international cooperation uh, angle of it. Um, just a reminder to the audience to please you know submit questions via the Q and A for the panelists. Um, we'll have a, a discussion uh, with them uh, in a second. But first, I'd like to hand over to uh, Veronica Ginsberg, uh, who is Deputy Head of Research at the Yuri Anton Antonovich Israel Institute of Global Climate and Ecology for a response to the uh, presentation that we just had. Over to you, Veronica. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for inviting me and giving me an opportunity to take part in such an interesting event. Uh, I'd like to offer it, uh, but I'm, I'm going to go at a tangent uh, on this relevant topic. Uh, uh, I work for a research institute and uh, uh, university grads come to us uh, for uh, uh, for uh, post-grad studies uh, and uh, for depending their PhD uh, papers. So. Uh, I'd like to offer you a view of uh, uh, of experts uh, who uh, start providing professional training to uh, post grads. As is clear from uh, the title of our university, uh, uh, it focuses on the global, uh, global uh, climate and environmental challenges. Uh, we study various uh, aspects uh, such as uh, physical monitoring of climate change. We uh, prepare various papers on uh, climate change. We look into uh, adaptation issues, develop climate change strategies. We study uh, the uh, impact of uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, on the climate change. Uh, and. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we also develop the register of greenhouse gases in Russia, and we provide the methodological support to this initiative. In addition to that, uh, we uh, develop uh, the techniques to study climate change. We use various uh, mathematical modeling uh, techniques and pathways, and we also look into such interesting issues as uh, climate engineering, solar balance, uh, Ch changes uh, to maintain the climate, uh, uh, the, the current climate, and carbon storage uh, issues. We also develop various uh, programs and strategies linked to climate change. Uh, our professors take part in various uh, uh, conferences on climate change, including COP, uh, and uh, uh, they take part in the IPCC uh, meetings. Uh, they act as international experts on taking inventory of carbon emissions in other states. Well, this is a brief overview of the work streams that we pursue at our university. Uh, and uh, now I'd like to emphasize the importance of partnering, 
partnering up uh, and establishing collaboration with uh, universities and higher education institutions. Of course, it's important for us because like I said, uh, post-grads uh, uh, and uh, uh, come to us from the Moscow State University, uh, namely the Department of Economics, uh, Geography, uh, Physics, uh, post-grads from the Higher School of Economics uh, also uh, collaborate with us. Uh, the uh, The MEFI, the Social University, the Moscow University of Foreign Relations uh, are amongst all partners. And uh, technical disciplines uh, such as aviation experts, uh, core industry experts are, are also uh, our partners because, you know, greenhouse gas, em gas emissions and climate change uh, are interlinked. Therefore, a, a cross-functional approach uh, is something that we should all uh, focus on. I guess uh, everyone emphasizes time and again that in the past few years, both across the world and in Russia, uh, people started uh, studying uh, more the climate change and the focus has shifted from uh, studying the physical uh, problems of climate change. I'm talking about uh, physics of uh, atmosphere uh, uh, and so on and so forth towards uh, studying uh, the social and the economic issues as well as decision-making issues. And uh, even psychological impact is something that we uh, started shifting our focus towards. And of course, uh, this is of uh, topmost importance. This is uh, a welcome trend because uh, any strategy development, any comprehensive program development requires, like I said, a uh, cross-functional approach. And uh, today's forum is a good example because it is uh, attended by uh, by uh, people from various uh, departments focusing on economics of the climate change. However, uh, physical aspects uh, should not be ignored because they uh, form the basis uh, for basically uh, any strategy and for any adaptation uh, to the climate change. The the most important thing for us to understand is how the climate changes in a specific region. What's What are the consequences for a specific industry or the national economy in general? Therefore, uh, physical aspects of the climate change uh, also require an earnest uh, study. Our institute has established close co collaboration with various colleges and Georgi Safonov already mentioned in his uh, speech that uh, the Sakhalin State University, uh, which is right now in a spotlight, I would say, uh, of uh, our efforts to study the uh, climate change and the decision-making process uh, pertaining to climate change, uh, emissions, uh, inventory, and so on and so forth. The Sakhalin region became a pilot region uh, as far as the climate change policy is concerned. And of course, we do collaborate with this university. We plan to, to train uh, professors of this university uh, at uh, our campus, uh, but uh, it's a two-way street. This is something that I want to mention. Uh, we are not just acting as uh, professors. Uh, we are not just training them. Basically, uh, post-grads uh, who come to us and colleges that collaborate with us enrich everything that we do. Uh, it's a two-way street, uh, uh, and their collaboration augments and supplements everything that we do. I'd like to uh, point out several major requirements, uh, let's put it this way, uh, developed by uh, the organizations towards post-grads who come to us. Uh, and uh, like I said, cross-functional approach is important and uh, it has nothing to do with a particular discipline. However, climate change efforts require a set of uh, special skills. And we believe that uh, students should uh, develop such skills uh, during their studies at universities. And the, the first topmost important skill is uh, an ability to carry out research. 
you know, because if you are unable to do research, if you are unable to study and analyze uh, literatures, if you are unable to draw conclusions based on the information that you are provided with, you are not going to be a uh, good researcher. So it's important to teach students uh, uh, these skills uh, while they study uh, at colleges. Uh, Computer literacy is also important. Uh, uh, being a programmer, a machine learning, uh, statistics are important skills that should be developed by all the students. Uh, because you know, uh, machine learning is heavily uh, used in uh, climate change uh, studies, and being curious is the top most important uh, skill. So uh, we have to. Uh, uh, to make it interesting uh, for our students uh, to be engaged in uh, the various research researchers. They should uh, keep on being curious. You know, they should be uh, curious about climate change in the first place, as well as uh, climate change strategy development issues. To wrap up, I just uh, want to express my heartfelt gratitude to all the uh, professors uh, of various colleges and universities who uh, have undertaken huge responsibility and commitment on uh, training uh, the right experts. And the postgrads that come to our university is a good example of that. Uh, uh, your work is important. Your role uh, envisions a huge amount of responsibility. Thank you so much. And I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, uh, Veronica, for your thoughts uh, on uh, on the original uh, questions, uh, um, on the original presentation. Sorry, um, I'll going to hand over for our first question uh, to um, uh, Valentina Gorbatenko, uh, who I think has a question for Professor uh, Bobulo. Uh, Valentina, you're still on mute. I hope you can hear me. I switched my mic on. Yeah. Uh, right. So my question goes to uh, Sergey Babalev from the Moscow State University, and it, it goes like this. Would you please uh, give me uh, an explanation on the following? Uh, you. You mentioned in your presentation that uh, you tried to link the climate change with the uh, Russian national economy. I beg to disagree uh, because in Russia we have uh, the uh, we have the geophysical observatory center that has been uh, operational for over a hundred years. It published lots of papers. It is heavily engaged uh, in uh, developing various agreements for uh, different enterprises coming from all walks of life. Uh, they focus on uh, a better approach to developing the energy sector, the agricultural industry. They look into the issues facing the transportation industry. In other words, all the uh, issues linking the climate change and the economy is something that uh, our main uh, geophysical observatory has been focusing on. Because you mentioned that you were the first one to actually look into this issue. Maybe I misunderstood uh, what you tried to uh, uh, inform us about. Well, thank you for the question. Uh, of course, it's hard uh, it, and it would be naive of me to say that uh, the Moscow State University is the pioneer on linking the climate change and uh, the economy. Well, uh, my uh, words primarily uh, uh, hold true for the textbook that was published back in 2005. Correct me if I'm wrong, Georgi. Uh, uh, th this was the first textbook uh, uh, published on climate change. Uh, change's impact on the economy. So the Moscow State University was the first college that authored a textbook on that. As for the main geophysical uh, observatory, I uh, totally agree with you. And I tell my undergrads that uh, eco economics is a very primitive uh, science as compared with the natural sciences. And of course, we can only assess the damage, the benefits, uh, the and the economic uh, mechanisms, uh, such as the mechanisms to assess the carbon uh, emissions and so on and so forth, are only based on raw data. And raw data comes uh, from the uh, physical disciplines. Uh, therefore, 
the work done by observatories and researchers uh, is the uh, basis for the economists uh, to uh, uh, keep on uh, their work. Uh, Russia is trying to assess uh, the uh, uh, the impact of the uh, carbon uh, carbon sink and carbon storage on the uh, economy, and of course, uh, economists use uh, the raw data coming from the research uh, done by the natural scientists. So uh, I, I'm not saying that the Moscow State University or our faculty uh, in particular is the pioneer. Uh, it's, not, it's not something that I try to say. Thank you. If I may, uh, let me also offer uh, a brief comment on that. Of course, the observatory that you mentioned uh, is uh, a topmost uh, important institution. And uh, it's just worth, worth mentioning that uh, the uh, advanced uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, theory was uh, developed by uh, Professor Budika back in the 1970s. And uh, in 1972, uh, he uh, stated this theory at an international conference uh, focusing on uh, climate change. And actually, uh, the uh, feedback uh, from his uh, foreign counterparts was quite negative back in the 70s, but it provoked a heated debate. Uh, people started uh, looking into, uh, into this issue, though uh, they were quite skeptical about it. But uh, what happened next is uh, in the mid 1970s, global research involving the then USSR, the US and the European uh, countries uh, started in earnest and actually it uh, signified a tectonic shift in the uh, climate studies. And uh, by 1992, when the uh, 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 UN Framework Convention uh, was initiated. Well, we have to understand that it was preceded by a huge amount of research. And of course, uh, the, the Soviet scientists played a huge part in that. And I already mentioned that the Higher School of Economics joined the uh, Integrated Modeling uh, Consortium, uh, Assessment Modeling Consortium. Uh, so uh, the advanced integral assessment uh, models uh, uh, focus on economy with the energy industry being inside and the uh, natural environmental uh, part is uh, very important. So uh, you have to assess the impact of the climate changes on the, economy, uh, on the economy and vice versa because economy cannot but have an impact on the climate change. Uh, these are part uh, and parcel of uh, the contemporary efforts. Uh, you can hardly imagine uh, economy without uh, uh, climate change uh, consequences. So uh, uh, I guess uh, climate researchers are uh, at the forefront. We are lagging slightly behind, but we, we do assist you. For instance, what kind of decision making uh, should be established? And Sergey was right in saying that uh, we have to show uh, the economic expediency of focusing on the environmental issues and the climate change. This is a huge task for everyone. Unfortunately, uh, decision makers oftentimes uh, focus only on monetary issues rather than climate, cha climate changes. And we have to demonstrate to them that uh, sustainability and uh, uh, preserving uh, the current climate conditions uh, are important. Of course, it's uh, a really huge challenge for us because now it's difficult to provide the decision makers with precise calculations. And Sergey already mentioned a number of uh, challenges and uh, obstacles. And it's great that we have uh, flagship universities and experts in Russia who are trying to drive the message home. And I'm totally positive without, that without our foreign partners, we will not be able uh, to become a success. And the experience shared uh, with us by our Manchester counterparts and other British and foreign counterparts is extremely useful. I've been taking notes, by the way, Liz, thank you so much. I've been taking notes uh, on what you plan to do in terms of partnerships uh, and uh, steps looking forward. We, we will definitely look into it and we will come up uh, with uh, some ideas uh, for partnerships. Uh, you'll see for yourselves that Russia is trying to do its best uh, to link uh, the economics and the climate change as well as the anthropogenic factor. 
Can I just come back briefly and say we would be delighted to discuss partnerships with you and, and anybody else on the call. We'd be delighted. Yes, no, it's, uh, it's beautiful to see uh, uh, the, the potential roots of uh, uh, international cooperation taking hold uh, uh, on, on this very call. Um, thanks very much uh, for, for kicking us off that uh, uh, provocative uh, question. Uh, Valentina, I think uh, it was a, a fruitful, fruitful start to our discussion. Um, I uh, just wanted to kind of uh, abuse my privilege as, uh, as moderator and ask one of my own questions uh, uh, to start off with. Um, and it, it, it links into, uh, into that, that discussion we were just having. Um, and uh, it's, it's for all of you, but I'll, 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 I'll come to it in turn. Um, as uh, Professor Bobilov's uh, presentation highlighted, and as that discussion uh, highlighted, you know the, the economic costs and the, the and the damage caused by climate change, by the environmental impacts, by the health impacts, you know, is is quite staggering. And in many ways, that's that's a huge imperative for action. What, what in your view, is the balance between emphasising those costs, the damage, and encouraging action through focusing on the, the opportunities, the benefits that lie in the green economy, in renewable energy, sustainable development. How do you strike that balance? And do you find in your engagement with um, uh, policymakers, with business, that one approach is more effective than another? I guess I'll, I'll start, with, start with, uh, with you, Professor Bobilev, as it was uh, sparked by your presentation, what your thoughts on that are. Thank you so much uh, for an excellent uh, question. Uh, well, it seems to me that the entire humankind uh, is looking for this balancing act between uh, the uh, e economic development uh, and uh, the uh, climate uh, impact uh, and the environmental impact because you know the human footprint on the environment uh, if we take a close look, uh, uh, great one for Russia. Unfortunately, uh, environmentalists, and Gary already mentioned th uh, that in his presentation, environmentalists uh, have never uh, uh, been given the priority uh, when uh, the uh, national economy development strategies were uh, developed. Uh, and um, I believe that in the past two to three years, given the uh, nascent challenges uh, that we are currently seeing in term, uh, because of the new carbon emission rules uh, approved by the uh, result in uh, some new external factors that we uh, have to take into account and respond to. Another important issue for Russia uh, is uh, the uh, attempt to uh, take into account the uh, environmental services uh, uh, and uh, mitigating the climate change impact. So I believe uh, it's a must uh, to find a balancing act between uh, the researchers, the decision makers, and the wide public. We need to involve uh, undergrads and postgrads, because we are trying to drive the message home to everyone. Uh, well, uh, just the most recent example, uh, last year in August 2020, we discussed uh, the uh, issue of the environmental debt. Uh, uh, you probably heard about the environmental uh, footprint uh, term. So basically, we carried out an online uh, forum uh, attended by Russian and foreign counterparts, and uh, we discussed this very important issues. Actually, I, I initially thought that uh, there, are, there were a few people in Russia interested in the environmental footprint, but uh, the following day I was called and said that a total of uh, 350,000 people followed us online. Just imagine that, 350,000 people. 
and 99% of them were probably young researchers. I'm totally positive about that because they are concerned about the environment. Therefore, I believe that uh, uh, it's important to establish an alliance uh, involving uh, researchers, policymakers, uh, uh, early career researchers. This is the only way forward to deal with the climate change. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, uh, Professor Bobilov. Um, I'm just going to go to uh, Professor Price uh, for her views on, on how, we, how we balance that messaging about the, the opportunities and the costs. Yes, thank you. Um, well, I fully agree with the comments my colleague made, and I think um, it's really important that we all work together to do this. I think there is a great deal of climate anxiety, and I think part of our role is to offer hope and solutions um, that speak to different audiences. Um, so part of it is through education and research. And, you know, as mentioned by our colleagues, our students are really passionate about this, but also it's something that employers want. They want uh, graduates with skills who can address these challenges. And I think it's a, a case of equipping people to make the changes and benefiting um, them and highlighting the positive benefits. So it's about showing people how to do it, but also making it easy through policy. And there are some cases where policy really does need to drive these changes. So it has to be a partnership uh, with um, members of the community, academics, policy makers, um, and uh, people who have positions of influence. What we're trying to do in Manchester is have a very a sort of bottom up approach in that um, the community uh, sort of sets the agenda, sets priorities, and then the city council takes those on board and then feeds those into central government. And I think, you know, I think we're all aware what an important opportunity COP26 is with the government's 10 point plan to really make this happen. But we have to make it easy for people, we have to make it manageable for people, and we have to highlight the benefits. They're not just climate benefits and not just environmental benefits their benefits in terms of equity health um, economic benefits and and yes there are costs but ultimately we can't afford not not to do them and we have and it's it's our job to find the right way to do that and the best way to do that is is do that together and I think it also depends on which audience you're talking to you have to talk the right language to different audiences so in some cases, it's important to emphasize the health benefits or the social benefits. For some audiences, it's to um, highlight the economic benefits of the green economy. Um, and in others, it's important to highlight the environmental benefits. And I think our colleagues have pointed out quite rightly that we owe it to our, our students and our younger generations to really drive this forward now and, and make that difference. So I would agree with everything that my colleagues have said. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Price. Uh, I'll go to, I saw uh, Veronica had a, a hand up to uh, uh, contribute on, the, on, on this point. So over to you, Veronica. Uh, thank you so much for giving me the floor. Uh, I uh, would uh, totally agree with uh, the previous speakers, uh, yeah, but I'd like to emphasize the following interesting point. The climate agenda and the uh, sustainable development goals agenda uh, went hand in hand for a very long time. Uh, those were uh, two stories uh, that uh, uh, did not overlap for some reason. But right now, the climate agenda is becoming part and parcel of the sustainable development agenda. Uh, and now uh, we realize to a uh, greater extent that uh, climate change researcher, researchers, uh, climate adaptation projects are part and parcel of sustainable development. Uh, and uh, you can hardly uh, solve these problems uh, in total isolation in silos. And I believe that it's a very relevant understanding which holds true for the global community. But unfortunately, uh, we only realized that in the past few years. The cross-functional approach that was mentioned time and again during the day is really important. Of course, uh, you cannot, uh, you can hardly say that uh, we should uh, only focus on the physical issues of the climate change or uh, economic uh, damage of the climate change. We up, uh, join our efforts and carry out joint researches. Now, this is another important uh, point that we uh, started realizing in the past few years. A 
purely scientific problem of climate change can hardly be solved by climate experts alone. It should be tackled by a by cross-functional teams uh, involving people from all walks of life. Thank you, Veronica. Over to you, uh, Dr. Svanov. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, that, that was a great comment, uh, uh, but let me uh, share my thoughts with you. Uh, the training course of the Higher School of Economics devoted to the green economy, sustainable development, and so on and so forth, is attended by 100 to 120 uh, people. And uh, this is quite a huge figure. It's an open course, but also uh, external trainees can attend it. For instance, people from various ministries and agencies, uh, corporations, uh, municipal councils, uh, experts, uh, students from other colleges and e eco activists can attend this training course, which just goes to show you that such training programs are quite in demand at uh, the moment. And uh, quite a number of undergrads and postgrads want uh, to defend uh, their papers and thesis on the environmental and uh, uh, economic issues. And uh, I'm talking about uh, students from different faculties. So indeed, uh, there is a need in the younger generation uh, to uh, get more knowledge on this particular issue. Another important point I want to uh, highlight, uh, in Russia, uh, uh, it's gaining steam and some of the uh, most important challenges, sorry, changes uh, can now be highlighted. For uh, external reasons, for instance, uh, the export market changes. Uh, for instance, if we export our uh, energy products, uh, oil, gas, uh, iron ore, fish, uh, timber, you name it. Uh, the markets uh, evolve and uh, they have to meet uh, the environmental certification requirements. Uh, uh, sustainable fishery uh, requirements are now a must. Uh, carbon footprint requirements are a must for uh, oil and gas industry, for instance. And Russia exports all of these products. So uh, now uh, large corporations have to reduce their carbon emissions. Uh, get, they have to get certified. And uh, that's why uh, younger experts uh, who are pundits on all these issues are in uh, great demand. This, uh, this process is slow, but it's gaining steam. Another important uh, point is that uh, we have approved the National Climate Change Adaptation Strategy. And uh, it's a great opportunity for the universities, for the national universities, uh, including those based in the region, uh, in the regions, uh, to uh, start helping the regional authorities in developing climate change uh, adaptation uh, strategies at the level of municipal authorities and regional authorities. And this is something with which all the Russian regions have to comply with by next year. So the question is, who's going to help them in doing that? Well, uh, the uh, uh, Federal Environmental University might help uh, might help with that, but what about the Tomsk region? I believe that universities and research institutions should be heavily involved, and they should start this work right now. Uh, climate change adaptation uh, is always about curbing the uh, greenhouse gas and carbon uh, carbon emissions and ways to calculate uh, these emissions, and uh, all of these things should be taken into account in the decision making process. Therefore, universities and researchers. Uh, should be actively involved in this very important work stream, which is gaining track right now. I'm I'm being a bit about that, by the way. Sergey mentioned that uh, we are the last generation that can prevent uh, the global disaster and save the planet. But, uh, you know, uh, changes are gaining steam even in Russia, despite the fact that it's not a top priority for the federal authorities. Uh, the process is ongoing and we can help uh, promote it and uh, point them in the right direction. And we can capitalize on the European experience and the British experience uh, to avoid the mistakes that our foreign counterparts made. And the uh, international context is really important uh, for us to better understand what challenges and opportunities we face and what would be the best way to shape our approach uh, at a national scale and at a regional scale 
in Russia. Maybe I'm being too optimistic and too upbeat, but uh, this morning I received an invitation uh, to address a forum uh, for the energy industry and uh, tell them about the decarbonization. But I do know for a fact that they hate decarbonization uh, as an issue, uh, and I'm still uh, I'm still on the fence on whether to accept this invitation or not. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sonov. Um, I think uh, that uh, hopeful and optimistic note is uh, is quite a good uh, point for us to uh, to end this first session uh, of the day. Um, I am also optimistic, even more so having uh, heard about uh, all of your work and the cooperation um, that you encourage both um, local, regional and international level. Um, I uh, kind of wholeheartedly support um, uh, all, all, all that you've said about uh, uh, balancing the, that, that messaging, ensuring that we that you're providing the objective analysis of the impacts of climate change, but also offering hope and solutions. Um, so thank you all. Thank you, uh, Dr. Svonov, uh, Professor Bobilov, and Professor Price uh, for your presentations. Thank you very much to uh, Veronica for your, your expert uh, contribution too, and also thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Valentina, for your, for your question as well. Um, session one your panelists you're, you're welcome to stay and, and join us for session two uh which we'll be switching over to uh now uh but thank you again uh on session two um uh, our focus is going to be on engaging young scientists to tackle climate change um we've got uh another uh four speakers one of whom uh you you've already met uh uh from asking a, a question earlier uh but our, our four speakers are uh, Evgeny Zarov is a scientific researcher at uh, UNESCO in the Department of Environmental Dynamic and Global Climate Changes, um, Yuva State University. Um, Solia uh, Akhmet Kalieva is a PhD candidate at Manchester Metropolitan University and is head of the UK Russia Arctic Early Career Researchers Collaborations uh, and UK Polar Network. And Yulia Zaika. Um, head of the International Department of the Federal Research Center, Polar Science Center of the Russian Academy of Sciences, head of the Arctic Office Association of uh, Polar Early Career Scientists, Apex Russia. And Professor Valentina Gorbatenko, head of Meteorology and Climatology Department at Tomsk State University. Uh, we've got a tight schedule, so I'm going to hand straight over to uh, Evgeny Zarov uh, for the first presentation. Over to you, Kenny. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope everyone can uh, hear me well enough. Without further ado, I will pass on directly to uh, my presentation. My name is uh, Evgeny uh, Zarov, uh, and I'm a scientific researcher at uh, the Ugra State University. I'd like uh, to brief you on uh, our vision of the role of uh, universities uh, in uh, shaping the global climate change uh, strategy. And I will also uh, share with you a number of uh, specific cases of the Ugra State University being involved. Uh, and I will give you uh, um, uh, in particular more details on one of the projects uh, that we are engaged in. Uh, 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 there are 30 major universities based in our region in Nizhny Vartovsk and Henty Maysysk. And, uh, uh, these three universities uh, train 50% of the uh, undergrad pool, which means that uh, we can uh, basically shape the knowledge base of uh, most of our students. This is uh, the adjacent uh, region of the Yamala Ninetsk district. It has no colleges of its own, just the branches of other universities, which means that uh, people living in that area uh, could uh, study at our colleges. At for, as for the Ugra State University, it's a relatively young college. We celebrate, this year we're gonna be celebrating our 20th anniversary. Uh, we, uh, our university includes five uh, institutes and we train about 5,500 uh, uh, undergrads. Uh, this is just a, a brief overview of uh, our vision uh, of the role of the colleges in shaping the global climate change uh, strategy. Uh, for uh, most uh, 
for most people, science is something abstract. No one knows uh, what scientists and researchers do. Uh, and uh, we need to establish a common understanding of the uh, outcomes of the scientific uh, researches. Therefore, uh, well, uh, I have to mention that our uh, students uh, after graduating uh, go to work for various uh, companies and uh, agencies. Therefore, we believe that uh, universities should be the ones interpreting the global uh, climate change agenda because uh, they boast the major bulk of the knowledge and experience. Therefore, they should translate their knowledge to both the society, the industry and the decision makers at various levels. Uh, all the different elements shown in this slide uh, are closely linked with uh, the universities uh, who also have a huge impact on the uh, world scientific agenda. Uh, thus, it's a closed uh, cycle. It's a closed loop. Uh, colleges should also uh, partner up with high schools because, you know, high schools uh, train uh, next generation experts and these are the guys who will uh, manage the entire planet. Therefore, uh, the knowledge that we can provide them with right now is something that, we, that, that they will capitalize on in the future. As for the main tools that the Ugra State University uh, uses uh, to uh, work on the global climate change agenda, uh, well, uh, they include publications. Uh, we publish uh, the outcomes of our scientific researchers. Uh, we also publish our own uh, ju scientific journal, which is called the Environmental Dynamics and uh, uh, Global Climate Change. Uh, we uh, are engaged in a pilot project uh, uh, titled uh, Zonal Field Practice, uh, Field Research, which means that our students uh, will move uh, from, uh, from the south to the north to study different uh, environmental uh, zones. Uh, this project will uh, provide our students with the knowledge on on our region. Uh, uh, they will see how diversified it is. And I really believe that the outcomes of this project could be used at an international scale because uh, it's, uh, it's a very unique project. Another Im interesting initiative that uh, we embarked on is uh, uh, the UGRA Environmental Skills uh, Initiative uh, to engage high schools. In addition to that, we take part in various scientific researchers uh, and uh, collaboration projects. Amongst other things, uh, we uh, organize uh, the uh, International Field Symposium uh, called the uh, West Siberian Peatlands and Carbon Cycle. Uh, it's gonna be organized this summer as well. Uh, scientists from all over the world uh, attend this uh, forum uh, to discuss the international agenda. And uh, one of the most important uh, projects, I believe, sorry, uh, tools, uh, is uh, the uh, Mukhrina field station. It is uh, situated uh, at a certain distance from Hantemansisk. It is aimed at, uh, well, the main objective of this uh, field station is to study the environment. Uh, it is surrounded by uh, forests and peat, uh, peatlands, uh, uh, and it takes part in various scientific events and educational fora. The uh, Mukhrina field station is engaged in uh, multiple researchers uh, carried out uh, jointly with uh, foreign counterparts. Uh, these photos show just a couple of examples of such programs. It became quite apparent uh, that uh, we need to involve uh, uh, early career researchers and uh, undergrads as much as possible because uh, there is a need, there is a clear need amongst them and uh, uh, the uh, field station uh, offers a unique opportunity for them because it's a unique region and, uh, you know, climate uh, predefines uh, everything that happens in the region. Uh, we initiated the International Scientific Integration of Early Career Researchers, uh, ISINCAR for short. Such uh, initiatives, uh, and that involves both uh, international conferences and the international publications, show that uh, when uh, th that students uh, 
are not involved uh, to the extent they want to get engaged, uh, to be engaged. Uh, and uh, there is an informational gap in the uh, student community that we have to fill in. Uh, there is uh, a language barrier, uh, as you know, uh, especially uh, it's especially relevant for international events. We also need to incentivize students to take part in such projects. Uh, and uh, that's why we initiated it in the first place. So the main objective is to improve the quality of scientific research, uh, foster the knowledge transfer and eliminate uh, the uh, cross-cultural and generational barriers. Uh, the main outcomes are shown at the bottom of the slide. Uh, we managed to increase the academic mobility amongst uh, the undergrads. We managed to acquire high quality uh, data uh, for uh, uh, various scientific publications and uh, thesis papers. And now we plan to organize a, uh, a scientific uh, conference. Uh, we decided not to limit this project to our uh, university only. Uh, we try to involve uh, colleges based in the in Western Siberia as well as uh, the UK. So basically, uh, we are now a team of six universities, and uh, that includes the two main Nizhnyvartovsk, the Ugra State Universities, uh, and some of the UK colleges, uh, including the uh, University of uh, West Britain, the Bangor University, and the University of the Highlands. Uh, uh, four uh, students and uh, one supervisor were provided by uh, each and every uh, university and now they are taking part in this project. Uh, we are currently at uh, the first stage. Uh, the, the universities had to team up based on the uh, scientific projects that they uh, want to pursue. Uh, well, all of them study the climate change, but uh, at, a, at different uh, angles. Uh, we have tasked them with uh, specific objectives, and now we are developing the roadmap and the protocols uh, that uh, uh, will be pursued during uh, these projects. So the next stage uh, would be to increase the mobility. Of course, uh, it's a bottleneck uh, given the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, as soon as the pandemic uh, is over, uh, uh, the UK uh, students uh, will come to Russia and vice versa. If uh, the pandemic uh, lockdown is not, is, if the pandemic cost lockdown is not lifted, then uh, we'll work online. And ultimately uh, the project will end with a final conference. So these are the current activities that we're pursuing. We carry out uh, Zoom-based meetings. Uh, we. Uh, organize English language training programs for uh, Russian speaking students because, uh, you know, uh, uh, their proficiency in English leaves much to be desired. And we also prepare various thematic lectures for undergrads uh, so that they could be, uh, they could plunge into the project that we pursue uh, so that uh, they better understand the advanced uh, climate change issues and the way they are being researched, researched. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Evgeny. Um, it's really interesting to see, uh, particularly the, uh, the work out of the field station. And I, I hope the uh, restrictions are lifted soon enough for uh, uh, Bangor University students to, to visit as well. Um, I'd also like to uh, visit some of these uh, field stations. Um, just a reminder to the audience that you can ask questions uh, through the Q&A function and we'll uh, put them to our panelists uh, at the end of the session. Uh, but now I'm gonna hand over to uh, Solia and uh, Yulia for your uh, presentation. Over to you. Sorry, Solia, you are still on mute. My bad, sorry. <laughs> um, hi everyone. Um, Okay, my name is Saulia, uh, and uh, along with Yulia today, we'll be talking about uh, collaboration that we have uh, created uh, between UK Power Network and Apex Russia. And uh, we'll be talking on behalf of the entire team. There's quite a lot of us. Um, 
So first off, uh, a little bit about our um, national committee. So UK uh, Polar Network and Apex Russia are UK and Russian branches of Association of Polar Early Career Scientists. And uh, uh, the main thing about our organization is that we are run by early career researchers and all the events that we organize, everything we do is for the early career researchers. So the main aims uh, of our national committees is first off career development and cre facilitating networking between UK and uh, Russian early career researchers as long as uh, having education and outreach activities, uh, not only for uh, the ECRs, but also for the general public. Uh, here in the UK, we also do lots of uh, school outreach. Um, and also, uh, we disseminate different polar-focused opportunities as well. Um, so one of them being our school, as Evgeny uh, mentioned a bit earlier, it's uh, Arctis. Uh, which stands for Arctic Interdisciplinary Studies. The main aim uh, of the course is to facilitate bilateral and interdisciplinary cooperation of ECRs, both from the UK and from Russia. And uh, this school uh, that we ran twice uh, was a great uh, result of uh, our successful cooperation between the two national committees starting in 2017. And, uh, as far as uh, our participants go, we were able to recruit over 200 applications uh, of really, really successful ECRs and uh, over 80% of our participants were uh, university level. Uh, so either PhDs, uh, master students or postdocs as well, uh, as well as uh, some participants from other research institutions, both from the UK and Russia. Um, so for our course in 2019, we were able to recruit 13 ECRs from UK and 15 ECRs from Russia. Uh, the, the numbers increased slightly for Arctis 2020 and we were able to get 17 ECRs both from UK and Russia. Um, so as far as location goes for Arctis 2019, uh, we had it for a week um, in February in Apatite Kirovsk and Murmansk, uh, Murmansk region in the Russian Arctic. Um, and then the next year uh, we had a course in the Western Siberia, so in Khantimansysk, uh, Russia again for a week in February. And uh, the main aim was to kind of have a uh, diversity in our geographical locations in order to show how uh, Russian Arctic is not only the Arctic, but also there is a lot of research, for example, in Siberia. Um, so um, we had covered mainly five disciplines, uh, those to atmosphere, marine, cryosphere, terrestrial, uh, human and social studies. Uh, and uh, Throughout those uh, studies, we had both a uh, theoretical part where lecturers either from the UK or from Russia uh, delivered the lectures. And most of the times we had we had uh, interviews with local um, people as well, and were able to visit a research station um, in the area. And then for uh, Arctis 2020, we had a similar uh, setup, so five disciplines with uh, the only difference is due to the location, our marine component changed to the hydrology component. And uh, one thing I'd like to mention is uh, on this pictures, atmosphere and hydrology were actually uh, held at the in the research station earlier. Uh, the others were around the Yugra State University. Um, uh, so at the end of our course, we asked our participants, uh, lecturers, uh, everyone to fill out the feedback form. And uh, as far as uh, the feedback goes, I think we got quite good uh, ratings. So most of the participants saw that the course was good. They enjoyed it. They learned from it. They really enjoyed the organization. And uh, they said, 74% uh, said that they, uh, the course met their expectations. And uh, also we asked them to rate the course uh, based on different lectures and field trips. And uh, again, we got quite high scores for that. And we did a similar thing after the Arctis 2020. And again, here we got quite high scores uh, for all the previous categories as well. Uh, okay, thank you. I will uh, pass the microphone to my colleague, um, Yulia from Apex Russia. 
Yeah, thank you, Sole. I hope that you can hear me well. Um, dear colleagues, thank you so much for inviting us. Uh, yeah, and just to continue, uh, Sole, I just want to say that, um, again, uh, the chorus and everything, all our projects are run by early career researchers for early career researchers. And we have a very nice um, community at, with, with which we try to foster links between the next generation of Arctic scientists and not only Arctic scientists. And also when we meet at times at different conferences, we also see each other and we are all friends and we call them ourselves Arctis alumni. Uh, the next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, and as Sole said, we have had the complexity of different outcomes within uh, both our projects. Uh, the geographical, uh, and Sole also mentioned that we had the first uh, field chorus in the Arctic and the second in Siberia. So it's uh, mostly to get to know the area, which is uh, very important um, to understand local conditions, both for uh, UK scientists um, and for Russian scientists as well, because none of them uh, quite know the regions. Um, and also Arctic and Siberia, I, know, uh, I think that they are both um, uh, two main driving uh, geographies for climate research. Um, and uh, we had within this geographical outcome, the collaboration and cooperation within different uh, levels, um, such as international bilateral, interregional, and even intra-regional when talking about the organizations that has been involved as we had the multiply of different partners um, universities, uh, research centers, museums, NGOs, and so on. And also, of course, the main, the main part of our projects is always people-to-people -people collaboration uh, within um, senior scientists and uh, young scientists at different levels. The scientific level, as Sole has already mentioned, and it has been mentioned during the past session, uh, the interdisciplinarity that we try to cover, interdisciplinarity that helps to uh, converge the sciences and also to see the methods from different sciences, which is quite an important thing and tool for further um, work within the climate um, research uh, area. And also we have had the different administrative, not only barriers, but also successes as we have passed to them. Uh, we had um, uh, we had gained the understanding and knowledge uh, how to work within different financial mechanisms, um, different immigration situations, access pro procedures and, and rules and so on. So we, we have gained a lot of great skills, uh, both administrative uh, and learning. Um, so I think that it's a very good platform uh, for professional level up. The next slide, please. Um, and uh, with our following project, uh, we just thought that since we have um, understood that there are a lot of gaps and probably challenges uh, that Evgeny also mentioned uh, in the previous presentation, we thought that it would be great just to summarize and have some kind of a self-reflection. Um, so we thought um, that this, this project, the following project will help us to um, make some kind of a context uh, for further to see what kind of gaps and challenges and also opportunities and ways forward probably exist um, in bilateral communication and between UK and Russia. And we thought that um, community based uh, community consultations will help to understand that. And we have launched some time ago in the, uh, at the end of last year, the survey, which gave a lot of uh, responses. And we will summarize the survey and we'll um, show the results and discuss the results at the conference. The next slide, please. That we aim to have uh, on 18 and 19 February. Um, so in a one week and a half, uh, please join us. Uh, we hope to uh, make a good consultation. And I just want to uh, sum up here for this particular project uh, that it is quite important. And it also have, has been mentioned uh, during the last session, that we need to make a very good bridge in between uh, policymakers, scientists, young scientists, and now local communities. Uh, so with, that, with this particular project, we aim to have and build a good and better cooperation based on uh, community needs and community consultation. And it is the process that is happening at the international level at the moment. As for example, at Arctic Science Ministerial process, uh, they also look into the barriers and challenges um, of the cooperation, international cooperation in Arctic research. Thank which you, is Julia, thank you. <clears throat> closely connected to climate research as well. 
Yeah, thank you. And join, please join us. Thank you very much, Yulia. I'm sorry we had um, a slight technical problem. Tom has been dis disconnected, our moderator. So I'm now going to hand over. Thank you very much, Yulia, for your presentation and, we'll, and Solie. Uh, we will get back to you with the questions um, after Valentina has spoken. And Valentina, um, I would like you to ask to start to join. So I'm giving the floor to Professor Valentina Garbatenko, Head of Meteorology and Climatology Department from Tomsk State University. Welcome, Valentina. Thank you so much. Uh, let me share my screen with you. Indeed, I uh, work for the Tomsk State University and it's uh, worth mentioning that uh, the undergrads of our university enjoy a great opportunity. Uh, 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 I'm sorry, uh, let me go into the full screen mode. I hope you can see my PPT stack on your screens. Uh, well, for some reason, uh, there are some technical glitches and I seem to be unable to advance my slides. Now it seems to be working. Anyway, uh, the matter is that uh, Tomsk hosts a total of six universities. Uh, there are a number of uh, large-scale scientific uh, organizations. Therefore, undergrads who study at our university are lucky, I would say, because uh, they uh, do enjoy a great opportunity of taking part in various scientific researchers uh, uh, right from the get-go, as soon as they become freshmen. Actually, uh, sorry, uh, uh, sophomores uh, are involved uh, in uh, scientific research projects. This slide just shows the structure of the faculty I work for. And I just wanted to draw, draw your attention to the fact that uh, our faculty is a cross-functional one. Uh, since we do all co cooperate with each other, uh, we are able to pursue uh, cross-functional researchers uh, focusing on uh, geology, economics, uh, and uh, you name it. And we pursue various ecosystem-focused uh, research projects. In addition to that, uh, Tomsk uh, hosts uh, two uh, large academic institutions uh, specializing in climate changes and environmental issues, uh, as well as the environmental impact of the climate changes. We try to involve fellows and researchers from these institutions as professors uh, to, at our universities. They act as supervisors when our uh, undergrads uh, pursue various uh, projects and uh, try to defend uh, their thesis papers. They can also task uh, our uh, students with uh, other projects uh, funded by external parties. This slide just shows the broad range of uh, scientific researchers pursued by the uh, staff of our faculty. It's worthwhile mentioning that this list, list includes both fundamental uh, research into climate changes in Siberia, as well as the uh, impact of the Great Vasugan Swamp uh, on the uh, climate changes in Siberia and the Russian Arctic. There are a number of applied uh, researchers that we pursue. For instance, better forecast of uh, hazardous uh, convection uh, problems with the help of satellite imagery, climate uh, impact on uh, the public health. Uh, there are uh, purely applied researchers such as the impact of the climate changes on the transportation industry development in the region. Uh, this project is funded by the, apply, uh, by the Russian Applied Research uh, Foundation. And uh, another work stream is uh, the agrometeorological researchers. It's worth mentioning that Our students are eager uh, to uh, take part in uh, the aforementioned projects. Uh, 
master's program grads here graduate with uh, flying colors uh, can be uh, in can be hired as professors at various colleges. And by the way, this is something that they, uh, this is an opportunity that they actively pursue because uh, they, they do gain experience of uh, cooperating with uh, various uh, stakeholders uh, during their studies. So they uh, either become uh, post grads uh, or uh, members of the staff. Like I said, uh, we try to involve uh, students in the scientific research projects starting from their junior year. Usually uh, uh, a member of the staff is uh, responsible for supervising several undergrads. Therefore, uh, a discussion of an issue involves, uh, could involve both uh, juniors or uh, bachelor uh, programs, uh, students, uh, master's uh, program students, post grads, uh, and uh, they all help each other. They try to explain difficult things to uh, freshmen and sophomores. In other words, this entire uh, chain is something that we try to promote because uh, it's an effective tool in studying various disciplines and uh, solving various scientific and applied problems. This particular slide just uh, provides a list of the conferences that are organized on an annual basis, but either in Tomsk or in the adjacent cities based in Western Siberia. It just goes to show you that our students have every opportunity to take part in multiple scientific conferences. Moreover, master's degree uh, undergrads uh, are to take part in scientific conferences uh, if they want to get a degree. Therefore, it's a part and parcel of their studies. And usually such uh, conferences offer specific uh, breakout sessions for uh, early career researchers featuring various contests. Therefore, uh, students are extremely interested in and eager to take part in scientific conferences and contests. And by the way, it's worth mentioning that uh, oftentimes our students come out as winners of such contests. 10 to 15 papers are delivered at such conferences by our master's degree students. Uh, and by the way, bachelor students uh, for whom it's not a must to take, in, to take part in such uh, scientific conferences usually do. I just wanted to say a few words about uh, the so-called uh, early career research school. In the past few years, uh, we've been organizing the Early Career Researchers School. And uh, ECRs are, uh, well, uh, are trained and taught by both Russian and uh, foreign seasoned scientists and uh, academics, uh, and uh, that uh, allows us to highlight both regional, national, and international issues that uh, the scientific community focuses on. In addition to being an academic platform, uh, such schools uh, make a great emphasis on practical studies and researchers. For instance, climate change modeling students uh, were offered an opportunity to use uh, a uh, supercomputer, uh, which is a uh, high computational power machine based in uh, the Tomsk State University. Uh, and uh, that uh, increases uh, the level of interest generated amongst the students. Uh, this, uh, this chart just shows that uh, if uh, there are monetary incentives provided to the students, amongst other things, then 
students are quite eager to take part in the conferences and uh, sometimes the same student uh, delivers three papers, which just goes to show you that uh, such skills are uh, of uh, high importance to them. This slide just lists a number of uh, issues our undergrads and postgrads are currently working on. And since students are being involved in uh, such researchers uh, at uh, early stages, uh, oftentimes uh, they get grants on their own. They have a clear understanding of uh, what they want to do after they graduate from the university, especially given the fact that uh, they have every opportunity to pursue their scientific projects. It has already been mentioned that um, It's great when uh, a university could afford to be a flagship uh, university in a specific work stream. And I do believe that our university is an undoubted leader in studying uh, the impact of climate change. And uh, this is especially true for uh, applied research uh, in uh, to the uh, climate change. We study uh, the impact of climate changes on uh, the national economy. For instance, I already mentioned uh, the uh, funding that we uh, secured uh, for the project to look into the impact of the climate change on the transportation industry. And of course, uh, we need to team up with uh, economists and uh, experts from other uh, domains. Without such uh, teamwork, uh, I don't think uh, either uh, climate experts or economists uh, would, would be able to uh, demonstrate any progress stemming beyond a simple declaration of their uh, objectives. And of course, we'd like to see uh, specific outcomes. A week ago, by the way, uh, the uh, WMO uh, held uh, its uh, meeting the main objective uh, of uh, this organization is uh, to uh, supervise the training programs offered to the climate change experts. I did take part uh, in uh, the WMO meeting, particularly in uh, the session focusing on the methodog methodological uh, guidelines for the undergrads. And one of the recommendations was uh, that we should augment the existing uh, curricula uh, with, uh, ap uh, with applied task uh, projects. And it's worth mentioning that our university does offer a training course in applied climate studies. We try to vest uh, our uh, students with every single piece of knowledge that uh, we enjoy. And our faculty and our department in particular uh, are engaged in applied projects. Therefore, uh, we are uh, open to any type of cooperation. And it's always a pleasure to take part in various events such as uh, today's uh, online uh, forum. I hope that uh, this uh, discussion will be another step forward towards uh, better understanding each other and establishing mutually beneficial uh, networking links. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Gorbatenko. I, I was really uh, interested to see the variety uh, of work and uh, papers and the uh, uh, amount of uh, uh, effort that goes into designing uh, uh, a good level, well, providing a good level of interaction um, through different different stages of uh, young scientists' uh, uh, education and uh, research journey. Um, thank you very much uh, to all of our panelists uh, for their uh, really interesting presentations there. Um, just a reminder to the audience that you can post questions in the Q&A uh, button, uh, which we'll find in your Zoom controls. Um, uh, please do feel free to put questions in there. We'll put them uh, to our panelists. Um, well, I'm going to do, I'm going to kick off first with a question. 
um, which uh, struck me from from all of those presentations really. And it's about the the, the importance of uh, international cooperation and and an international offering in engaging um, uh, early uh, early career researchers, young scientists. Um, and I suppose my question is, you know, how important is it in your experience, how important do you think it is to have that level of international cooperation, that ability to offer international interaction, research opportunities in different countries with uh, an, international, uh, uh, an international group? Uh, um, early career research uh, in uh, climate science in particular. Um, over to you, uh, Evgeny, to answer uh, your thoughts uh, first on that. Thank you so much for the question. Well, uh, I hope it was clear from my presentation that uh, we uh, uh, we do uh, support engaging in in evolving projects. As for how successful we've been, well, uh, uh, let me split uh, your question into two parts. The first one is we need to involve and engage early career researchers in scientific projects in general. And of course, we do face a number of challenges in this regard, because uh, you know we have to incentivize uh, early career researchers to do anything. In Russia, uh, there is a uh, misunderstanding that uh, env environmental studies are only about desk-based work. Most of the most of the undergrads believe that uh, uh, environmental uh, work is only about issuing fines to such large companies as Gazprom. And uh, they say, why would I want to go uh, to do some field research? Because it's mosquitoes, it's been in a swamp. Uh, so uh, there is a gap between uh, their expectations and the real needs. So oftentimes, uh, uh, students don't understand what the real work is all about. As far as the international cooperation is concerned, we try to heavily and actively involve early career researchers and even undergrads, but oftentimes we don't see any motivation on the part of the uh, undergrads. And the main reason for that uh, is that they are not really proficient in speaking English. The language barrier is a huge problem because most of our students, when they encounter a foreigner, are really shy to uh, speak a foreign language, we try to uh, provide them with every assistance. Uh, we, uh, uh, we, we try to dispatch students to work with uh, foreign delegations who come to our university, but it, it's a problem. Uh, I've been working for 12 or 13 years at the university and uh, and uh, you can take my word for it that I've only been able to involve five to seven students in working on the international agenda. So it's not a widespread process, I mean, international cooperation. So one of the uh, solutions uh, on our part was to organize uh, international schools that uh, are attended by international undergrads and international early career researchers. We just want to demonstrate to our students what global science is all about. And the joint field work is also important, uh, especially given the current uh, researchers, uh, researchers that uh, result in uh, publications in uh, peer reviewed journals. And by the way, if uh, the papers are published in English, then it's uh, another opportunity for students uh, to uh, hone in their English speaking skills. Thank you. Thank you, Evgeny. Uh, it was really interesting to hear uh, your experience, and I, I can certainly sympathise with the uh, the shyness of uh, some of the students in speaking a foreign language. It's uh, uh, not always uh, not always easy thing to do. Uh, thank you, um, Yulia. I suppose I'll, I'll come to you next and uh, ask well, what are your thoughts. Um, how more, how important is it for there to be international cooperation and an international element uh, to the research to help engage uh, early careers researchers? Yeah, thank you so much, Tom. It's a very interesting question and very much, um, I think, not disputable, but current and urgent at the moment, and not only at the moment, but I think that the great example of international cooperation for young scientists, when the young scientists came up to the stage, 
uh, was the International Polar Year that we all know, uh, which also studies the climate change. And um, I think that priority for the next <laughs> International Polar Year would be the climate change conditions and changes for that. Uh, but the previous uh, International Polar Year, which has been undertaken in 2007-2008, has one of the main focuses on early career scientists and young scientists, because previously they, there were no generational shift in between uh, International Polar Years, and it's been no um, the continuity of knowledge, scientific knowledge, which is very important uh, in terms of monitoring of uh, climate conditions, of environmental conditions. So um, at that time, 2007, 2008, uh, young scientists came up to the stage as being the part, not as the field assistants uh, during the research, but as the active uh, participants of the process, co-production of knowledge, co-production of uh, um, projects, um, as Evgeny said, the co-production of, of everything, the active, active partners of the process itself. So I think that international um, cooperation of young scientists at the moment is at its, I think, maximum uh, when we look at the uh, retrospective uh, to the past years. And I think that we do quite a, a, quite a good um, examples and collaborative projects. And actually, the Association of Polar Early Career Scientists that we, uh, with Sole, has presented here um, as the national branches of, uh, in the UK and in Russia, is also the project which came out from the International Polar Year 2007-2008 to engage young scientists into the research and co-production of research and a scientific agenda. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Some really uh, good points. And yeah, I, uh, I'm always uh, uh, really uh, impressed by the amount of uh, uh, activity and interaction there is uh, between early careers uh, researchers at the moment. Uh, Solia, did you want to uh, add your views on, on the, the importance of the international element uh, in early career research? Uh, thank you for the question, Tom. Uh, yeah, of course. Well, I will give my perspective as I am an early career researcher myself. Um, I think it's very important to start um, those kind of international collaborations and just simply networking as early as you can. So I think uh, at least from uh, the courses that we've created, uh, uh, we kind of brought together the early career scientists uh, from UK, from Russia, and the main component of all the field courses we had was for people to get talking. And um, there, there is like theoretical part in field work, but it's also people living together for a week together, uh, joking around, becoming friends, and uh, from there, uh, kind of. Um, establishing those lifelong connections. So hopefully in the future, uh, there'll be international projects on a bigger scale, just because people got to know each other while they're still PhD students or master's students. Um, so I think it's very, very important, at least um, from an early career research uh, scientist kind of uh, point of view. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. Yes, really positive thoughts. Uh, Professor Kubotenka, um, uh, the, the, the same question to you, uh, really, on the, uh, what, what the international cooperation adds, but also I had a, an additional question which occurred to me uh, while, while you were giving uh, your presentation, um, particularly when you were talking about uh, the research chain which is set up and the interaction between PhD and master's students and master's students and undergraduates. Um, and I think, uh, I just wonder what your thoughts are. Um, I think you, you, you showed really convincingly what the benefits to the early career researchers are of all of, the, all, all of that engagement and that early exposure to research. But I wonder if you could say a bit about as well what the benefits are to the master students and the PhD researchers of having that interaction with the, with, with, with the younger researchers, with the younger scientists and the early career researchers and how that benefits them and their development as well. Thank you so much uh, for a very interesting and relevant uh, question. And uh, well, uh, just before uh, the turn of the year, I gained some experience of engaging master's uh, students uh, 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 to explain to freshmen and sophomores in a remote uh, format on, uh, the relevance of all the issues. 
and uh, well, uh, one of my students, when she uh, had to uh, offer explanations to freshmen and sophomores, actually told me that she better un uh, she got a better understanding of the issue at hand. And when early career researchers uh, start talking to each other, well, uh, to each other, I would say it's easier for them to network because, uh, you know, they are not shy about speaking foreign languages. And I believe that uh, they have more opportunities. My generation did not stand a chance uh, back in our time to talk to each other. Now they have the networks, foreign, uh, sorry, international networks. Uh, there are field stations, there are uh, websites that meteorolo meteorologists could use as tools to talk to each other. There are uh, English language uh, programs and podcasts. And our uh, PhD students, by the way, can use the MedEc uh, website uh, to brief uh, all the foreign counterparts on uh, the uh, snow uh, cover uh, in Siberia. So. Thanks to the WMO, meteorologists uh, have established close cooperation a long time ago, and I welcome all of you to our community. Let's uh, team up uh, on other issues. I don't think that the language barrier is a problem. Well, of course, we are not as proficient in English as we would like to be, but I would, uh, I guess you would agree with me if I say that uh, on the second day of uh, talking to a, uh, an international counterpart, uh, you no longer experience a language barrier. And if there is a will, there is a way, as they say. So thank you so much for the question. Uh, this is my view on that. Uh, and uh, uh, as for teaching students, like I said, when they talk to each other, when the masters and PhD students are involved in teaching uh, freshmen and sophomores, uh, I believe this this is a, a good way to uh, to approach this uh, problem, and this is true for the chains I have to work with. Thank you. Thanks uh, very much for the uh, uh, kind of comprehensive uh, answer, and uh, I, I I agree that once. Uh, once the very first barriers of uh, awkwardness are overcome, you know, uh, the co common understanding develops, and you can you can get by quite quickly. And also, as we've learned over the uh, over the last year, there are lots of uh, wonderful uh, tools uh, such as uh, Zoom with simultaneous interpretation, which can help us uh, as well. Um, uh, my, my my next question uh, for you uh, is. What uh, is to with what role early career researchers can play in the the, the popularization of climate science in in terms of in communicating it uh, outside of the academic community in talking to their friends and in inspiring uh, others in their generation, um, which I think is also really important um, and can often uh, help provide a, a perhaps a more relatable voice. Um, uh, Solia, I'll, I'll come to you to you first. What do you think the role is of uh, early career researchers in in kind of uh, promoting and popularizing uh, climate change uh, science and research? Thank you. Um, well, climate change, I think it has been an issue for a while now, but uh, it's um, actually receiving the right amount of attention. Maybe it still should be more, uh, but at the moment, so basically people uh, who are coming to science with fresh mind actually realizing how global warming is a big issue for uh, our world, basically. Uh, they're all um, interested uh, in doing this research to tackle climate change. Um, so I think the role of ECRs is very important as uh, it is somewhat fresh issue and should be addressed by people uh, who have um, open mind who are here to learn uh, from the best and uh, who are uh, interacting with each other as well because um, I myself from Kazakhstan originally and back home people don't really care about climate change that much but uh, you know by just talking to friends saying like you should be recycling or why don't you car share instead of having a car each one of you in your family it's not very good for the climate um, so uh, in that sense, I was unable to persuade my parents, for example, but my friends and my cousins, they do listen to me. So I think that uh, generally like a role of ECRs is very, very important um, in uh, tackling climate change issues and establishing those international collaborations. So, and this is not me saying that older generation is closed-minded or anything like that. I'm, I'm sorry if I came out across like that, but um, 
I'm just trying to say that uh, younger people, uh, it should be like in their blood now saying that climate change is an issue. We should all be working uh, towards uh, tackling it. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, that's a really good point. Um, and don't give up on your parents, keep trying. Um, uh, Yevgeny, uh, what, what's, what's your view? Um, how, how can early career, early career researchers and young scientists play a role in um, communicating uh, climate science to, uh, to the broader public and inspiring more action and interest? Uh, this is a very interesting question, I would say. And basically, uh, Saulia partially answered that. About a week ago, uh, we talked to the uh, regional government and we discussed uh, an issue of uh, pursuing a joint Russian Kazakh uh, project uh, on the uh, river, which, well, actually, uh, uh, the river that goes uh, uh, into the Tom River uh, outside Handamansisk uh, has its estuary in China and it flows through Kazakhstan. So uh, our project will focus on uh, studying the riverine environment. And Horizon 2020 program envisioned a very similar project. Uh, uh, well, the details were given to you by the uh, Moscow State University. And quite a number of uh, European counterparts from, inst for instance, uh, the Dutch counterparts uh, pursued a number of uh, uh, projects uh, on uh, cleaning their rivers. Uh, so basically all the reports that uh, we heard uh, were quite similar. Uh, uh, River and environments are a trans-border issue, uh, and that means that we need to team up efforts of various governments. I'm sorry, uh, reconstruction is underway at our university somewhere upstairs, so there is much background noise. I'm sorry for that. Uh, hold on a second, uh, they are drilling uh, the walls. Anyway, negotiations is the only way forward to promote uh, such trans-border, transnational uh, uh, projects. And actually our European counterparts uh, told us that they had to nurture the new generation early career scientists who would basically understand the relevance of such uh, global uh, projects and problems. The initiative that we came up with uh, to clean and preserve uh, the river I mentioned uh, would require early career scientists who are pundits on this expert because it's a long river uh, whose estuary uh, is in China. And uh, it's a real threat. It's a real challenge that we have to focus on in our region. Uh, but like I said, you need to uh, nurture and develop uh, uh, the next generation uh, ECRs. Uh, I'm sorry, there is too much background noise. So I'm gonna end it at that. Uh, thank you, uh, you Kenny, and uh, thank you for not letting them silence you uh, and uh, powering through. Um, Yulia, uh, I'll, I'll come to you. Uh, um, what do you think uh, of the, the importance uh, of the role of uh, ECRs in, in communicating publicly about their research? Yes, thank you, Tom. Uh, you're bringing a lot of very critical questions, um, to be honest, and we always talk about it um, at an international level. And I don't have much to say and to add to what Sole has actually said. But um, the very important uh, thing that we uh, have um, experienced and we have noticed uh, when working within UK, Russia, uh, organizing teams of all those uh, great events that we had is the flexibility that was our <laughs> our motto. Um, if we don't have any solutions to any, any um, kind of challenge that might happen, uh, we are very flexible to use something else. So young scientists usually have more flexibility in terms of using um, different modes, uh, different techniques, different platforms to communicate their science, you know. Um, so it's uh, one of those um, important um, things that we have learned from all our collaborations with UKPN. Yeah, thank you. 
Thank you. That's really a uh, really good point um, about the, uh, the, the the different media and channels available. Uh, Professor Gorbatenko, I, I'll come to you for the for the final remarks uh, of the session. Your view on the role of early career researchers in, in communicating uh, the climate science and inspiring others to take action. Thank you so much. Uh, well. Uh, uh, let me put my best foot forward and boast uh, what we do at our university. Uh, we are quite uh, uh, active in involving mass media and high school students uh, in promoting uh, the climate, climate change studies. Our uh, station is wide open to high school students uh, as well. Uh, we have uh, a number of uh, university-based mass media and uh, we brief them on the challenges that we are working on and the solutions that we develop. Uh, we provide them with every single required piece of information. First, of course, we publish such info uh, on our website, then we share it with the uh, Tomsk uh, mass media. So I believe that uh, info on the weather in Siberia. By the way, uh, we uh, gave uh, two or three interviews uh, to mass media on the weather forecasts in Siberia because, you know, we are in for a very uh, uh, freezing spell of weather. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, uh, for me, it's easier to take unexpected questions uh, as compared to uh, the ECRs, but nevertheless, uh, our early career researchers uh, are quite uh, active in being engaged in various efforts and they're quite successful in that. So we're working on that. And that brings me to the end of my comment. Brilliant, uh, thank you very much. Um, and it's good to hear about the, uh, uh, the level of engagement that you, you're, you're having with media. And I think uh, that we can all agree that uh, communicating about uh, climate science and, and, and the research going on uh, is, is really important to us uh, understanding and tackling uh, the problem. Uh, that brings us to the end uh, of, of this session. Thank you very much uh, to all of our panelists. Thank you, uh, Yevgeny, Yulia, Sali, uh, Professor Gorbatenko. Thank you very much for a really interesting discussion um, and hopefully really inspiring for any uh, uh, early careers uh, researchers uh, who are listening in. Uh, you're very welcome to uh, stay on the line and, and uh, join, our, uh, join our third session. But uh, thank you again for your time and your presentations today. So time now to move to our third session uh, of the day, uh, which um, is going to be a, a kind of a practical demonstration of some of the climate change research uh, going on uh, with a focus on uh, Arctic uh, research. Um, I'm really pleased uh, uh, to introduce our, our cast of uh, our panelists for this session. Uh, we have uh, Professor Mary Edwards, who's Professor of Physical Geography at the University of Southampton. Uh, Professor James Ford is Professor and Priestley Chair in Climate Adaptation at the Priestley International Centre for Climate at the University of Leeds. Dr. Olga Tutapolina, who is a leading researcher at the Laboratory of Aerospace Methods, the Faculty of Geography at Moscow State University and Dr. Gareth Rees, Senior Lecturer in the Scott Polar Research Institute, Fellow of Christ College, University of Cambridge. Thank you all for joining us, uh, welcome. Um, and as time is uh, short, I will just hand straight over to uh, Professor Mary Edwards uh, for your uh, initial presentation. Thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this session. I'm assuming that you can see the slides unless uh, the convener says no. So I'd like to talk about uh, the DEMA group, which has developed over the last uh, a couple of years as a, a UK-Russia um, uh, cooperation. And uh, my co-authors are the founders of the DEMA group, um, whom you can see here. And uh, special thanks also to members of uh, the uh, UK FCO and Henry Burgess at the Arctic Office for really supporting to get this uh, going. So why DEMA? Uh, well, 
the person that started this was Anatoly Loshkin in uh, Magadan, and he's the person who found baby mammoth Dima. So we tried very hard to make sure that our group uh, was called um, Dima. Uh, what we do is we look at long-term environmental change, long-term climate change and changes in the environment. Um, and these provide us with a, a background and an understanding about the larger scale mechanisms of climate change, things that we're not even yet observing today with current global change. So we think there's a lot of synergy in these um, um, interactions. So in terms of uh, the region we work in, it's basically uh, east of the Urals, so it's uh, Serbia, Far East, and it's a huge remote area, the institutes are scattered across it, and um, getting work done in this area takes much time and skill and effort, and um, you know, key strengths of, of the, the Russian scientists working in this area, their fantastic ability to get out there, get results, um, and get data in very challenging circumstances. And for us as international collaborators interested in the Russian region, this is absolutely critical for any success of um, scientific projects. Uh, but also perhaps particularly in these far flung regions, there, there may be, um, uh, restrictions on how much can get done, just there aren't so many facilities in some of these institutes and thus innovation can be curtailed. And so a, another synergy is to be able to link with some international institutions who may be a bit better resourced and so we can actually get a higher return on all the investment we make in our scientific activities. Briefly, just to rehearse what uh, I'm sure you all know, um, the Arctic and the Northern Hemisphere, North Northern Hemisphere regions are um, highly susceptible to climate change because of the, the, the process of Arctic amplification where things get more um, extreme towards the poles. And we see changes in the vegetation and particularly see changes in the cryosphere, permafrost thaw. Um, now, scientifically, uh, clearly Siberia and the Russian Far East, up there in the north, in the Arctic and the subarctic, are responding to this Arctic amplification and this climate change in many ways. And given the uh, proportion of um, far northern land masses, uh, the uh, region um, is um, not well represented at all in terms of the background, the context, or the long-term history of climate change, as you can see from the diagram on the right. If we can gather new data, we can get a range of things, um, understand that the whole scope of variation that the climate system can express, look more at past responses to changes in um, systems in response to climate change. We can look at potential future analogues. We can establish baselines prior to anthropogenic climate change of the last century. And we can also contribute to modeling of both climate and other systems like fire. So initially what we did was uh, look to training early career researchers. And this was um, initiated by an invitation for a group of us from the UK to go to um, Magadan to, uh, to have a workshop. But we rapidly evolved a broader set of goals. So uh, beyond introducing new software, we, we talked about um, spreading new techniques through the community in Russia that weren't currently used and, and came to discuss what might be of mutual interest so we could develop longer term collaborations. And so we've done quite a lot. Um, we've had uh, two workshops in 2018 in, in Russia and one in the UK in 2019. As previous speakers have mentioned, it is very important to get papers out into international journals in English. So we've been working on a special section of the journal Boreas with colleagues in the range of DEMA institutions to um, produce some of their recent research in this journal. We've had quite a few scientific exchange visits and we're actually working on a joint project that we initiated in Tomsk in our workshop, which is nearing completion. And, and excitingly, there are more small joint projects have approved, but of course with COVID, they're on hold at the moment. And we're also working on larger scale proposals um, under the aegis of UK NERC to develop uh, further cooperation. So, 
uh, future needs and plans from, from the point of view of our network, very important to maintain the contacts and continue the visits and keep up the momentum during COVID. And, and one of the few advantages or one of the few non-bad things about COVID is that we've all become used to these Zoom meetings, uh, which are fantastic for seeing old friends and meeting new people online without having to go away from your sitting room. So uh, we're trying to do that with online meetings, uh, continuing the, the joint products, um, linking to other aspects of scientific research in Siberian and Russian Far East, the Interact Network, the SecNet Network, for example. And one thing that I think is important and, and something perhaps that we can discuss is this linking across disciplines. I'm talking from a natural science perspective, but climate change clearly needs to link social and natural sciences together. And moving between the different uh, disciplines in an institution is important. Obtaining funding is difficult for both UK and Russian researchers. It's highly competitive, possibly even more so when you're very isolated away out there um, in the eastern part of the country. Um, so, uh, and another thing which I always have to mention in every talk I give is the problem at the moment about moving samples across um, international borders, should that be needed. And just a, 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 a thought about UK and Russian universities and institutes. In the UK, most of our natural science research is carried out from universities, although there's some big centers that also participate. In Russia, in the, uh, Siberia and the Russian Far East, um, we have mainly worked with scientists at institutes who um, are then linked to ECRs in the adjacent universities perhaps, or who are uh, junior researchers in those universities. And it is quite a different system. And I think at least for me, I could usefully better understand how the sort of administrative and academic geography of Russian universities and institutes works. So to finish just critical aspects, what I think of our success to date, it's indisputable that personal contacts are important and a sort of snowballing network can grow once you make those personal contacts very important to put in the time and effort, even if largely unrewarded in any obvious way to maintain cooperation. Um, meetings like this one are fantastic to find people in the first place to link with. And what can I say about the wonderful ECRs we have in our DEMA network? Nothing would function without them for many of the reasons that uh, the last speakers um, very well explained. So thank you very much for your attention. That's, that's it. Thank you, Professor Edwards. Thank you very much uh, for that. It was really interesting to see uh, uh, some of the research that's going on. And I'm glad that you did manage to uh, name the, uh, uh, the collective after DEMA. Uh, I think that's very important, uh, catchy names. Um, just a reminder to uh, everyone in the audience that you can ask questions throughout, post them in the chat, in the, uh, the Q&A uh, section, and we'll put them to the speakers uh, at the end of the session. But I'll hand over now to uh, Professor Ford. Well, am, I, am I on mute still or not? No, we can hear you. Oh, you can hear me, thanks. Just give me a second here. Well, thanks for the introduction, Tom, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, great to be here, and thanks for the invite. Uh, my name is James Ford. I'm a professor at the University of Leeds, and I lead the Arctic Voices Project, looking at climate change, wildfires, and adaptation in the Russian North. And I'd also like to acknowledge my, my team members here uh, from Russia, based at the Arctic State Institute of Culture and Arts in Yakutsk, and also my colleagues in the UK at the University of Leeds. Now, as Mary was just telling us, the Russian North and the Arctic as a whole is very much seeing the most climate change anywhere globally. Uh, and in Northern Russia, we're seeing warming about two and a half times faster than the global average. And this is having a variety of impacts. It's resulting in a change in the magnitude and frequency of extreme events. It's resulting in a thawing of the permafrost. And also for this project, it's increasing wildlife, wildfire activity in, in, in many areas. On top of this, we expect the Russian North to really see the most climate change anywhere globally this century. But despite this and these risks that we see and these changes that are ongoing, understanding on how these changes will interact with human systems, understanding of how people will experience and respond to these changes is very, very limited. 
you know, we've got quite a lot of understanding now of how the climate is changing, but the human dimensions area is where we have less understanding. And that's the case, not just for Northern Russia, it's a case across the Arctic. And the Arctic Voices Project responds to this, this lack of understanding. And our, and our goal is really to understand the factors that affect resilience to changing wildfire amongst indigenous and local communities in the Russian North. It's a project that we've just started back in December, 2020. Uh, we're funded by the International Program of the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. And we're focusing on the Sakhar, the Sakhar Republic and working with, a, working with our partner community of Sebian. And Sebian is a small remote community uh, populated mostly by Ivan and Sakhar uh, peoples. And I, I posted just a, few, just a few images here from the region just so you can understand what the, what the geography and the context of this region looks like. And this is where Sebian is located in, in Sakhar. Now, the project has a number of different questions. It's an interdisciplinary project. So we have, we have geographers, we've got anthropologists, uh, we've got uh, cl climate modelers, we've got satellite experts, a huge diversity of expertise in the project. And one of our first questions is really to find out what are the long-term trends in wildfire in this region? So we will be looking at satellite data to look at some of these trends. We're also going to be drawing upon the traditional knowledge of residents in Sebian, people who've got a very in-depth knowledge and understanding of the environment. We're going to access that knowledge to understand long-term changes in fire at the local scale. We're going to be trying to find out what is causing changing wildfires. What is the role played by climate and climate change, but also what is the role played by things around like land use management, mining development, cultural burning, all these activities of inter interacting with the, with the climate, we're trying to find out exactly how they're playing out and what's causing changing wildfires. And this is just, just some data shared with me by my, by my Russian colleagues just recently. And it really shows the, 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 the area burned and the number of fires in the Sakhar Republic over the last 25 years. And what we really see here is just how, how stark 2018, 2019 and 2020 were in terms of the area burns and number of fires. And just this last year, the Siberian wildfires really got international attention just because of that, that magnitude and sheer, and sheer scale. And what we're gonna do in this project is really look at this in a, in a longer term context as well, going back uh, to the 1950s, 1960s, if we, if, we, if we can. We're also looking at what are some of the impacts of changing wildfire, especially as changing wildfire interacts with traditional livelihoods and culture. Uh, the community we're working with, they practice uh, reindeer herding, hunting and fishing are also very, very important activities, both for culture, but also for livelihoods as well. We're also looking at food systems and health and well-being as well, and how they interact with some of these changes that we're seeing. And so far, we've done about 150 interviews with people living in Sebian, and those were all done remotely due to COVID. We've got very, very strong local buy-in, and so community members actually did the interviews them, them, themselves. And we're just starting now to analyze some of this, some of the findings. And what we found so far was that while the community was not directly affected by wildfires this year, there's been a whole range of indirect effects. There's concern, for instance, around reindeer health and migration timing. There's concern about, about the safety of mushrooms and berries, which is very important in the, tra the traditional diet of the region. There's growing anxiety about uh, the increasing uh, rates of wildfire as well. But results are very, very much emerging. We're very much at the early stages. We're also trying to find out how are communities and decision makers responding to these changes? What traditional coping mechanisms are being used? Is climate change adaptation taking place? And if so, what kinds of adaptations? And how effective are these responses being? And here we've already started to do some interviews with policymakers at state and federal levels. We're also looking at policy documents to, to see exactly how in policy, climatic change, adaptation and extremes are being incorporated. And so far, our, our findings here again, the very, 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 very early days. At the community level, we've documented the community to be using controlled bur control burning in the springtime to reduce the amount of, of fl flammable material. And we're also seeing the importance of collective cultural practices. Shamanism, for instance, is still widely practiced in, the, in this region. And so people seeking guidance from, from, from fire spirits around, around behavior activities and management. Um, at the policy level, at the 
policy level. So far, we've found few policies intentionally, intentionally focusing on, on adaptation to future risks in a wildfire context. But we are seeing efforts being implemented to better deal with fire and enhance fire response in light of some of the extremes that we're seeing. So things like uh, making fire breaks, uh, cloud seeding to form rainfall in the summertime. Also providing information as well to, to communities on some of the risks uh, that, we're, that, that, we're, that we're seeing. But in the policies that we've looked at so far, we see very little engagement, if any engagement at all, of indigenous peoples, indigenous knowledge systems. Um, that said, we're still very much at the, at the, at the early stages of, 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 of this. And finally, in the project, we're gonna try and find out what makes communities vulnerable or resilient uh, to, to, to wildfire. We've not started this yet. This is, this is gonna come in in, this, in the second year of the project, hopefully when we can start doing some field work, COVID permitting. But we're really looking at what role do institutions play? What role does indigenous knowledge play? What role does learning and collective action play in shaping how communities and households, how they interact with changing wildfire and how they respond and what enables that. So that's just really just a quick overview of this project. It's a th three year project we've just started. Uh, so hopefully this time next year we'll have a few more detailed uh, insights uh, emerging from the project. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ford. Um, I personally, I know it's a, a project that I'm uh, really interested in, really keen to see uh, uh, the results of, and indeed one day maybe some travel as well, um, hopefully. Uh, thanks. Um, and already we're seeing some uh, uh, some common themes coming through uh, in this. I'll hand over now to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Olga Tutabalina, um, and just for another reminder to post questions in the, uh, the Q&A and or the chat uh, for our panelists. Over to you. Uh, Thank you so much for inviting me to this uh, forum. If I may, I'd like to brief you on uh, the project uh, that involves a total of five universities, including the University of Cambridge, the Moscow University, the uh, State uh, sorry, Space Research uh, Institute, and the British Antarctic Survey. And uh, what we do is uh, we are studying uh, the way the northern forests of Russia uh, uh, change under the impact of the climate change. The previous speakers already mentioned uh, the Arctic amplification effect, uh, the fact that the forest and shrub advance uh, and impact tundra. That's why it's worth mentioning that starting from the year of 2000, we have uh, uh, received uh, more detailed satellite uh, images provided by the MODIS uh, system, Terra Aqua MODIS. And uh, this system uh, shoots Arctic and subarctic regions on a daily basis. And given the uh, cloud uh, cover, uh, we can get daily data on the changes in the uh, phenology of the vegetation. Uh, the maps. Uh, uh, that we received were not adapted for high latitudes. Therefore, one of the objectives of our project was to develop our own maps based on satellite imagery to uh, better understand what is basically changing in, in terms of the phenology of the northern area vegetation and what has been changed since the year 2000. Our major goal is to develop a methodology for assessing the dynamics of FITMAS of northern forests of Russia since the year of 2000 due to climate change and to provide such an assessment with validation at key sites. We are using multi-platform satellite and aerial imagery. Now we use UAVs or drones and ground measurements to this effect. One of the major parameters that we use is the leaf area index. Uh, based on the uh, and modus analysis, uh, and we also use the growing stock of volume as one of the major parameters. So then we compare it uh, with the climate change data, and that allows us to better understand the role of the climate change uh, clean changes and the impact of other factors. Shown on top uh, is something what I'm going to focus on in my presentation, while uh, the two lower uh, boxes will be uh, uh, 
uh, will be touched upon by Gary Threes uh, in his presentation. He's going to take the floor right after me. And he'll be talking about uh, the uh, uh, Sentinel uh, data that we use uh, for scaling up uh, the LA and GSV data, as well as the uh, field measurements and descriptions that we get as part of our field studies. The major uh, data sets uh, were prepared by the uh, Space Research Institute. Uh, these are uh, seven day uh, maps of the uh, leaf area index. A leaf area index uh, is a one sided green leaf area per unit of surface area. If it's two, then that means that we have two layers of leaves uh, per one unit of uh, surface area, which allows us to calculate the uh, uh, fetal mass. The uniqueness of the data set uh, is that uh, it, it is true for the high latitudes, unlike standard NASA uh, satellite image imageries, and the various gaps uh, have been filled by uh, our seasonal-based uh, knowledge on the LAEs. The era interim data turned out to be uh, the most accurate. Uh, uh, it's uh, it's much better than uh, the era five data, and we also used cumulative sums uh, of uh, temperatures above five uh, uh, degrees on average per day. And uh, another feature of the uh, Study is that we assessed uh, the LEA throughout the season uh, rather than uh, the peaks, as was the case in the past. Ultimately, we received a number of, uh, we generated a number of maps, and uh, these are maps uh, spanning a period uh, from uh, May to August. Uh, for years of 2000 to 2019, shown in the left top hand, uh, in the top left hand corner, is uh, the dynamics of the uh, LAAs. Uh, the uh, delta SAT shown uh, at the top right hand corner, uh, and the correlation between the uh, two data sets. As is clear from uh, this slide, in early summer, uh, it, on the 17th of uh, June, uh, the LA uh, changes were the most pronounced. The same holds true for the SA Delta SAT and the correlation del Delta. If you take a closer look at uh, the map for uh, the 17th of June, you'll see that the LA dynamics and the SAT dynamics uh, temperatures above five degrees uh, above uh, zero correlate quite well. The, so basically, uh, there is a uh, strict correlation between uh, temperature and the uh, leaf area index in early summer. Uh, if we deep dive into uh, the Timer Peninsula, uh, which is uh, in Siberia, uh, the red square shows the region. Uh, this is the vegetation type uh, map. Uh, this is tundra. Uh, the LA uh, at early at er in early season, uh, in late season, and uh, the uh, this curve shows that in uh, in the early season the temperature increase is more pronounced. Uh, while uh, at the end of the season, it uh, goes down almost to zero. Oftentimes, autumn uh, sets on earlier, but uh, this is not uh, clear from this particular chart. And uh, the Delta SAT and Delta uh, LA uh, coincide quite well. Uh, the peaks and troughs uh, coincide uh, year over year perfectly well. As for uh, the region south of Timer, uh, we, uh, uh, we're talking about Norilsk and the area outside of Norilsk. Uh, we did not uh, carry out field uh, studies uh, because of the pandemic restrictions uh, last year, but we used satellite data and previously acquired data. Uh, this region is characterized by industrial degradation, uh, a large scale industrial degradation. Uh, this region hosts uh, the largest uh, steelworks plant, uh, sulfur oxides are emitted in the area and acid ra rains uh, destroyed forests uh, in a huge area outside uh, Norilsk and in the Rybne River Valley. Uh, large uh, 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 
all arch trees were totally destroyed uh, outside this area and uh, they were replaced by uh, grassland uh, and shrubs. We decided to study the dynamics of this region in the past decade by using the Landsat uh, satellite imagery with uh, with a scale of uh, 100 meters. Uh, you can find it in the Google Earth engine. Uh, we analyzed over 1500 uh, satellite images for this area. Uh, and despite the industrial degradation, uh, which is ongoing, but has been reducing, it's quite clear that uh, the vegetation volume has been increasing. The uh, NDVI has increased in the Ribne River Valley. And there is an obvious trend uh, of uh, an increasing NDVI, which uh, shows that the climate change in the region results in uh, vegetation restoration. Now, I'm not saying that all the species are being regenerated, but the vegetation is being restored because of the climate change. When we uh, looked into uh, a detailed Im uh, satellite image, we saw that these are the two major areas that uh, feature a more intensive uh, increase uh, in the in NDVI index. However, uh, it's quite clear that uh, these are the areas protected against the man-caused uh, impact by the snow cover. Uh, uh, the moisture levels are quite high because uh, of the thawing of the permafrost. And uh, to a large extent, uh, grasses and shrubs are growing. Uh, uh, Large trees uh, are probably not growing there, uh, but we need to carry out field work to better understand what is happening in these areas. Uh, and the SAT uh, cumulative sum uh, is the uh, blue curve, while the NDVI, NDVI index is the red curve. Uh, they coincide uh, perfectly well. To conclude, it's worth mentioning that uh, this project, which is one of the most recent projects uh, uh, pursued since 1993 allowed us to uh, train the new generation of Arctic researchers. Uh, and uh, thanks uh, to the engagement of the British Antarctic Survey, we uh, started paying more data to the climate change data. And uh, since uh, we shifted online because of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we stepped up uh, the number of uh, training workshops that we offer. Uh, we offer lots of them right now. And uh, up until late March, uh, we'll uh, organize a number of them thanks to the funding provided by FCDO. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Olga. I think that was uh, really interesting. And uh, some of those charts have really uh, highlight the, the the dramatic changes going on in the Arctic, uh, but also the the great value that uh, the project is bringing in terms of access to uh, to data uh, uh, for um, uh, a number uh, for all the researchers. Um, I'm going to pass over now to uh, Dr. Gareth Rees uh, for his presentation. Um, another reminder just to uh, post any questions that you have in the uh, the Q and A in the chat. Um, and then, of course, uh, any panelists from our previous sessions are also welcome to. Uh, uh, join the discussion at the end. Uh, uh, over to you, Gareth. Sorry, Gareth, you are still on mute. Uh, okay, can you hear me now? Loud and clear. Excellent. Okay. Um, so, thank you, Tom. Um, thank you for the invitation to present to this forum. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I'm Gareth Rees. I'm at the Scott Polar Research Institute in Cambridge, where I lead the UK side of the project, which Olga Tutabalan has just been describing in her talk. Uh, like her talk, mine represents the work of um, a, a large group of colleagues, so I've um, given a short list here. Essentially, I'm giving part two of Olga's talk, and I want to focus on how we've been able to develop an understanding of how much biological material is contained within the Russian boreal forest. Um, 
our estimates, uh, Olga focused particularly on what we do with at the big data end of things, uh, with particularly with MODIS imagery, um, but all of this is, is rooted in field work. You've seen this slide before. Um, we've worked uh, in the field in two areas as part of this project. They're shown by the yellow stars uh, on this slide here. Uh, one in northwestern Russia on the Kola Peninsula and one in uh, northeastern Russia in the Sakha Republic. And I've also shown the Norilsk area, which is, so to speak, virtual fieldwork. What fieldwork looks like for us is something like this. Um, uh, this is an, a nice picture gallery. This is in fact all based on our fieldwork in the Sakha Republic in 2019, um, loosely based uh, around Yakutsk and um, a few hundred kilometers from there. In some more detail, fieldwork looks like this. Our main task in the field is to measure a lot of trees. Uh, we've, we've studied 40, more than 40 sites uh, in total, uh, distributed across our main field areas. And within those, we've measured something like 2000 trees. We measure, make detailed measurements of the geometry of the trees. Uh, and we, we spend quite a bit of time defining research protocols, so standardized methods of making measurements that can be, um, can be transmitted to other groups if necessary. So as I said, one of the things that we do is we measure the geometries of trees because that's the most direct route into estimating the amount of biological material contained in the trees. Uh, the other main task that we do in terms of measuring trees is to make almost direct measurements of the concept called the leaf area index, which Olga explained in her talk. Uh, we have two ways of doing that. Uh, they're both optical. Uh, one is a photographic method, which involves taking photographs pointing vertically upwards through the tree canopy and then doing some Im image processing on the photographs, which lets us calculate the leaf area index. That's shown on the left. On the right, uh, we have uh, the use of a, a dedicated optical, optical instrument for measuring leaf area index. And the diagram in the middle shows the, the spatial pattern that we use at each site to, to make these measurements. So, um, so much for our field measurements. Um, our next step is to scale up from the field scale. And the way we do this, well, we have a number of ways of doing this, which I'm going to talk about. Um, the most immediate way we do this is using UAVs, um, unmanned autonomous vehicles, um, drones. What we do is we fly the drone at various heights above the terrain and we collect uh, thousands of overlapping photographs from the drones. Uh, these photographs can be processed. It's a very intensive um, uh, procedure. It takes a lot of computing power to do this, uh, but they can be processed um, to make what's called a dense point cloud, which is illustrated, dare I try pointing? Yes, I do, uh, in this figure here. So the dense point cloud. Um, represents in three dimensions the geometry of the, the forest area that we're flying over. From that, we can calculate a thing called the canopy height model. I think that name is quite self-explanatory. And from that, uh, we can aim to identify individual trees and we know their heights as well. So we know quite a lot about the tree geometry and we can estimate the biomass. In fact, the concept which Olga explained in her talk, the GSV, the growing stock volume. So that's how we make the most immediate upscaling of our field data. The next scale up in the upscaling involves using satellite images. So we take our field data and we use those to train an algorithm, which we're still in the process of developing, but it's, we're quite pleased with it, uh, to upscale the data to the landscape scale to a spatial resolution of around 10 meters and a coverage of some tens of kilometers. So the example here is from the Sakha study area. This is a satellite image. It's had some areas removed because of cloud and smoke. Uh, the, on the right here, we see a very simplified land cover classification, which we actually generate from the satellite imagery. Here we have the output of our algorithm to estimate the GSV. 
Uh, there's a color scale for it here. Here, this is a, an enlargement of a little area over here. And this at the bottom right is what encourages us to think that our algorithm is working quite well. This is actually not from the Sakha study area, but from the Hibini study area in northwestern Russia. But we have on the right hand side, we have our um, algorithm output for the GSV. On the left hand side, we have some ultra high resolution satellite imagery, and we see a very good correspondence here. So we're pleased with our algorithm. The last stage of the upscaling takes us to the scale of the MODIS imagery, which was the origin of most of the satellite imagery that Olga was showing in her talk here. So what's illustrated in this slide here is upscaling from drone survey. So here, this is the um, Hibini Mountains uh, in the Sentinel image here. This little red area, which is enlarged here, is the area covered by the drone survey. Here we have the um, computer generated data product, one of them, one of the many products from the drone survey. This is a map of the canopy closure. And here at the bottom right is the MODIS leaf area index product. So we're using data generated from the field and from the drone like this through the intermediary step of the Sentinel satellite imagery to validate the drone, uh, the, the MODIS um, imagery here. Okay, so just to wrap that part of uh, this talk up, the current status that we're in uh, is that we can calculate, uh, loosely speaking, tree biomass. It's actually the growing stock volume and the leaf area index. These are two uh, important uh, biophysical parameters to describe what's going on in the forest, how biologically productive it is, more accurately from global scale images by training algorithms with our multi-scale approach, which starts at the field scale, which is the centimeter scale, through the UAV scale, decimeters, through the Sentinel satellite scale, 10 meters, to the MODIS scale, which is hundreds to thousands of meters scale. So this is, it's working, uh, it's still work in progress, but it is working. Olga concluded her presentation by saying something about the involvement of early career scientists and students. Uh, I will say something about that too, from the Cambridge perspective. Cambridge students, undergraduate students have participated in the Sakha fieldwork and in uh, Moscow based training based on fieldwork data. Both of those students have subsequently followed scientific careers, so that was extremely successful. What we have observed working with our colleagues in Moscow over the years is that the culture of student involvement in fieldwork is, is very strong in Russia, certainly in Moscow State University, uh, much stronger than it is in Cambridge, so we've learned a lot from this. We've had early career scientists, early career researcher participation in both the Sakha and the Kibini fieldwork, our early career scientist involvement has led to an independent scientific career. We've made extensive use of the Interact um, transnational access system. So we've used field stations in both Hibini and Sakha for this. And by doing that, that's propagated knowledge of this scheme and its potential. And in fact, we've now joined the Interact TA ambassador scheme to further promote this. And last, but made very definitely not least, I would say that the existing research links and trusted partner status that have existed between uh, the Scott Polar Research Institute and Moscow State University for some decades now have been strengthened um, as a result of this particular work and new ones have been developed. Okay, uh, just a couple more things I'd like to say. I think I'm still in time. Uh, we have a conference um, which is supported through the foreign Commonwealth and Development Office through the International Programme, which is next week, uh, and registrations are still open until the end of today. So this conference is broader in scope than the research that Olga and I have just been describing to you, but is rooted in it. And it's three days next week. And if you're interested in this, um, contact Beth, whose email address is at the bottom there. 
So that's all I wanted to say. Um, thank you for your attention. I think I stayed in time. Um, thanks also to the many colleagues and students who've contributed to this, this project. So I'll finish there. Thank you very much, uh, Gareth. Uh, Master, Master stayed in time, uh, as, uh, as did all of the speakers, which hopefully gives us plenty of time now for uh, further interesting discussion uh, of the topic. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for um, the really interesting presentations there, which I think demonstrate uh, some of the, the breadth uh, of, of work going on uh, 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 in the Arctic. Um, some really interesting uh, uh, takeaways there. And also interesting to hear from Gareth uh, towards the end there about the uh, the, the, the differing approaches um, towards the involvement of early careers researchers in field work and how um, uh, that, 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 that that's influencing a, a practice uh, uh, on both sides uh, of the uh, relationship. Um, I've got uh, a question uh, from uh, from the audience here, um, which uh, uh, I think is, I think is is addressed broadly uh, at, at all of you. Um, uh, it is uh, about the application of the research uh, which we've just heard about. Um, uh, what, what what is the application of it? How how is it applied? How is it communicated uh, to decision makers, to policy makers, to businesses where relevant? Um, and uh, how do you see it linking in, or how can it be encouraged uh, to be factored in uh, this kind of research? How can it be factored into things like the regional adaptation plans, uh, which are going to be forthcoming in Russia? Um, so I guess it's it, it's about that. The, the the next step beyond beyond the research the science uh, science policy interface uh, if you will um and what the plans are and your thoughts are on, on how that can work best um i'll come to you uh, uh mary to uh, to kick us off on that um with your thoughts on on how how this art of research can be uh uh fed in uh to uh policy decision makers and influence their uh, their act their actions Thank you. That's that's quite a challenging question to start with. It's certainly something we've been discussing with uh, members um, of the Moscow, uh, you know, uh, Foreign Office group. Um, I've been to uh, a meeting in Port Cullis House, which was specifically about the idea of scientific diplomacy. One thing that one gets the feel from working with our large and far-flung group of uh, Russian colleagues is that there's, um, and we've, we've, we've heard this in the presentations today, there's you know, intense interest and dedication to moving the science forward on climate change. Uh, and that is very positive. But as was, as was expressed in some of the talks about Russia, actually getting this further towards policy is, is going to be challenging. Um, I think that getting our work out more into the public sphere, whether it be through conventional means like, um, say, the BBC or other ways of going into the social media and talking about work is important because when you start that, you start people prodding um, their, their legislators to, to, to do something about it. Um, I, I think uh, all, certainly scientists, uh, uh, struggle with the um, crossing that bridge towards policy. I mean, certainly here in the UK, there, there is interaction between the all-parliamentary group, say on the Arctic, um, and, and interchange between scientists and reports are produced. So it's not like there's nothing going on, but I think trying to get what we do out there, that fantastic short BBC segment on Yakutia and the, and the decaying permafrost um, uh, was, was absolutely super. And I think it's this kind of in your face, um, you know, broadcasting um, about the science that might, might help move things forward. And that's a very spur of the moment um, answer to your very interesting question. Yeah, I can also- uh, very, oh. Yes. Uh, well, I was, I was, I was about to come to you, uh, James. Actually, but, uh, thank you, Mary, for uh, uh, an interesting uh, and uh, uh, thorough response. And sorry to have put you uh, on the spot first of all, while everyone else has had time to think about it. Uh, but yes, James, a very interesting, particularly 
because um, I know you mentioned the uh, the challenges engaging Indigenous peoples in uh, adaptation plan uh, planning, and just whether uh, there are any models out there uh, for for places that do it well. Yeah, I mean it's it's it's, it's challenging for sure, and I, I work in various contexts. I've worked in the Arctic in Canada for about twenty years with Inuit communities, and I also worked with communities in Amazonia and and in Central Africa as as well. And it's 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 always a, a challenge of you know linking research to policy. But I think one of the main lessons that we've learned from, from the work that I've been involved with uh, and some of the research coming out of the more kind of social sciences is that. For research to have impact, what, what, what underlies it all is, is, is the process. It's the process of how you engage the people that you seek to influence through the research project. And it's knowing what, what information they need, when they need it, uh, and, what, and what they can act upon. It's no point in giving policymakers information which they can't act upon or which comes too late. So it's about very, very early on in a project. Ideally, at the project design stage, is engaging those, those, those community members, policymakers in co-designing the research. So you're, you're, you're engaging them from a very, very, a very, very uh, early process. You know what they need. You can build some of their needs into their research, into, into the research projects and the kinds of questions that you, you, you ask, as opposed to, as opposed to say, leaving it till the end when you've done the research. Um, uh, so for example, in, in the project we're doing in, 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 in Saka, we've got very, very strong local engagements. So when we talk about policy, we sometimes forget the communities, you know, and the impact that we can have is at various scales. In our project, we're seeking to have local impact, which means engaging with local people, uh, local leaders. Uh, so for instance, we're working with the, the mayor of the community as a key, as a key player in our, in our project. We're also working with elders, given their important role that they have in communities as, as sources of information and knowledge and advice and, 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 and advice. Um, we're also engaging decision makers at the state and federal level as well at the design stage. And then throughout the project, we're going to be doing kind of regular communication to them. You know, some people don't want much information. They also want information at the end. Others want to be kept, kept abreast of what's going on on a, on a regular basis. Um, so we're going to be doing targeted policy briefs to, to, to different uh, government departments. We're also going to be engaging at the global level as well, acknowledging there's a lot we can learn globally from what's going on in Northern Russia. Uh, so we're going to be engaging with the, with the COP in Glasgow in, 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 in November. Uh, we've also got collaborators on the project working in UNESCO in their Indigenous Knowledge section. Again, just so we can start to kind of translate some of the lessons learned from this project to the global sphere, and also translate some of the lessons from the global sphere to the, the local level as, as, uh, as well. But yeah, the main takeaway message is, is the importance of, the, of this process of continually engaging with those people uh, that you seek to, seek to influence through a project. Thanks, James. I think that's a really a uh, good point about the consistency uh, of engagement um, and you're pretty well made. Uh, Olga, I can see that you're you're ready and waiting to come in on this. So over to you. Yes. Well, this is really well. It's always a burning question: how we can influence policymakers. And uh, unfortunately, there is not so much dialogue in Russia between the public and the government uh, on many aspects and on this as well. But Russia has signed up to Paris Agreement. So one way. Uh, to reach the policymakers is to provide them the instruments to assess what they need for the Paris Agreement. So one of our partners, Institute of Space Research, is now engaged in a big forest carbon project, which is what, one of the outputs will be the carbon maps that we can produce to show what's happening in Russia. And uh, what we can do, uh, well, we work together with them and the uh, Institute of Space Research doesn't work in the field, but we do. So we provide you know, the calibration for their assessments and this is how we can improve it. And they are quite experienced in dealing with uh, state institutions. Uh, they are engaged in uh, forest fire monitoring, for example, and they provide much more accurate maps than uh, the state statistics. So they know how bad it is, well, what uh, James has shown in his talk that uh, the forest fires are widespread. And um, so we can uh, talk to them, improve their estimates. We also educate our students, some of them become policymakers uh, in the future. And of course, uh, it's also, like Mary said, it's very important to talk about this on social networks in the active, uh, to active members of the society. So it becomes widespread knowledge uh, what we have in the Russian Northern Forest, for example, because there is still some, uh, well, society does have an influence. For example, our recent uh, 
changes in how the rubbish is collected. So for example, in Moscow now, you can have separate collection of different kinds of rubbish, uh, which was partly uh, the demand of the society. And this is how we pushed the government to start doing something about this. So I'm hopeful uh, that this uh, policy implementation will improve in the future, although it's unfortunately it's really slow process in our country. Thank you. Uh, it's really good uh, insight there. And uh, uh, yeah, I think uh, the, the, there's definite, definitely some movement uh, in that direction. It's just about working out ways to uh, accelerate it, really. Um, Gareth, uh, same question, same question to you, your thoughts on the, uh, the policy science interface. Well, um, a lot of really good points made already. Um, I'll pick, I'll pick um, one of them up, which is the one about um, the use of social media. I think this is um, increasingly powerful as a way of um, communicating, not necessarily directly with policymakers, but with the people who influence the policymakers. Um, and just make the rather obvious observation that this is something that uh, early career researchers tend to be a lot better at than late career researchers like me. So uh, it's it's another reason why we um, need to nurture and bring on the next generation of scientists because they're much more savvy about this than we are. Um, the other um, point that I was going to make is that uh, is that there's another vehicle for um, communicating. Um, um, research results and the you know the context of the research that we do explaining why it's important um, that has the potential to reach um, relatively large numbers of um, um, informed citizens and that's through things like science festivals and uh, this is something that the um, FCDO has supported uh, our collaboration uh, in doing and most recently we had a kind of reciprocal um, arrangement whereby we had significant Russian contribution to a Cambridge Science Festival. Um, unfortunately, that happened just as the pandemic was reaching us. So the audience involvement was quite low, but we also had Cambridge involvement in the Science Festival in Moscow. And the, the reach there, I think, was actually pretty large. Um, there were hundreds of people there. So that's, that's another mechanism to um, um, keep a hold of. Thanks very much, Gareth. The, uh, the festival is actually is the, very much the last festival which I attended before the pandemic as well. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> uh, but hopefully we'll be back back to that soon. Yeah, it was um, great time. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, oh, I, see, uh, I see Mary has, has, a, has a hand uh, up there. Um, I, I wonder if I can ask you to wrap, wrap those thoughts into your response to this next question as well, Mary, just to make sure that we're getting through uh, some of the other questions. And I suppose the, the point of this question from uh, Nina Kruglikova, actually, um, hi Nina, um, is uh, about advice um, on interaction between UK Russian institutions. Um, you know, I'm sure there have been some, some challenges, um, uh, but uh, any, a, a, any tips on uh, how to, uh, to navigate any, a, any of those challenges, how um, to uh, best, um, uh, best develop a productive relationship between UK and Russian institutions um, and make sure that the, uh, the, 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 the different bureaucratic and initiative processes align. There are always, there are always hitches and, and things and it's, it's not, uh, you know, uh, confined to to UK and and, and Russian institutions, um, this this is always an issue with doing fieldwork anywhere. My experience has been that doing working cooperatively with with Russian institutions is far easier than it is in many other parts of the world. Um, but I do put this down largely to the personal contacts and ensuring that when one visits an institution, one meets with the director and anybody else who who wants to meet with you and explaining yourself and, and what you're doing, taking the time for all those, you know, normal politenesses. Um, sometimes there are the most difficult things, I think, are the financial transactions. And that that is something that occurs on, on the British, you know, on the UK side, as well as the, the Russian side. Um, the ways in which we set up memoranda of agreements or how funds can be transferred 
between institutes whereby there are all these you know, fiscal controls of movement of funds between Russia and, uh, and the UK and vice versa. Those kinds of things can be a bit problematic, but I, but I think a little bit of patience and, and well, now how could we do this? Let's, let's sit and think what we, what we could do. I, I, I've really never encountered you know, massive roadblocks that say, no, we don't want to, to engage. We don't want to do this. There's, there's, there's good, good faith on both sides in general. And usually my experience is there is a way to overcome it, but there may be particular things that have happened maybe to the questioner that you know are, are, are something that that we could raise and talk about. Uh, my addendum to to Gareth was that another way to get policy going is the grassroots. I mean, absolutely agree that young people, as Solar said, young people um, are the people that are really going to get stuff going. And, and here we have Extinction Rebellion, and. Um, the UK government declared a climate emergency, and I think in no small part due to pressure from Extinction Rebellion. And now over 200 of our 450 odd local government organizations have also declared a climate emergency. So working to policy at the grassroots, I think is another thing that I just wanted to say. Sorry about that, Tom. I, no, I think it's a really valuable point. So I'm glad that, I'm glad that you, you, you made it. Um, and and uh, also delighted that you've uh, had such a positive experience uh, uh, cooperating uh, with Russian counterparts. Uh, to get the uh, the perspective from the other side, I think I'll come to uh, Olga next. And you know, how uh, and how have you found uh, cooperating with the UK counterparts? And uh, uh, any tips for for making making the relationship as productive as possible? Well, I think in general. Um, yeah, cooperating with UK and international scientists, you have to be inventive because the different, when different bureaucracies come together, <laughs> you have to know that it's science you want to get across and you, know, you want to accomplish your scientific plans and things. And sometimes you have to be inventive and the important thing is personal relationships. And, but I found, you know, I, I studied first in Moscow University and in Cambridge, and I found the two universities uh, very similar in terms of, you know, the ethics and psychology. So when scientists talk to each other, they find ways, I think. And I'd like to say that they're always uh, really open to new collaborations as well. And uh, I think uh, there is a lot we can share with the speakers in this session, with Mary and James, and uh, think about doing more online seminars, perhaps in the future, to share experiences and expand our projects, which are not stopping yet, uh, but they're continuing. So, uh, yeah, just being inventive and uh, pat uh, patient. Um, I think there is still less bureaucracy on the UK side. Uh, which is so it's always a pleasure to collaborate with British scientists <laughs> that's what I can say great good to hear it and also yeah very keen uh for for sessions like these to lead to further cooperation and uh yeah I hope you uh you, you guys will all be in touch Gareth I see that you have uh, uh something to add yeah, just very briefly, if I can, just to add to um, what uh, Mary said and what Olga said. Um, the, 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 coming back to the original question, um, obviously, the, you know, the key word, the obvious word is trust. Um, and it, 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 it's how you, you create the trust um, that allows you to do these things, because, yes, there are all sorts of silly obstacles that have to be overcome. And there are times, especially when you, as Mary said, when you're dealing with money things that when you have to be uh, you yeah you have to put some trust um, in the other but the other thing I was going to say is um, uh, there's more than one kind of interpreter um, there are interpreters who interpret um, language to you and there are interpreters who interpret systems to you and finding a good interpreter is such an important thing they're often the same people but but recognizing that this is what you need um, somebody who can say ah oh, how this system actually works is like this. You actually need to talk to this person and say that to them. Great, a nice advert for the uh, the interpretation industry there. Um, no, very valuable, um, uh, as they have been today uh, and ever. Um, James, I wonder if you uh, had a, 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 any final thoughts uh, before we close out the session on, on your experience cooperating so far? 
Yeah, I mean, I've only been working in Russia since December, so it's about the new. It's my first time working in Russia, so I'll, I'll hope we have some more insights moving moving forward. But I think that the points mentioned around the importance of trust and personal contacts, I think, so like my my work in other other regions are definitely definitely really important. And for the kind of the work I do, working with working with communities themselves, working with partners who have very strong relationships already with those communities is really really key. So. In our project so far, we've been able to start remotely only because we have very, very good buy-in from our partner community, from from from, from our contacts in, in in Russia. So that's that's yeah, really, 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 really important. Brilliant. Yes, hopefully, first couple of months of many, many more uh, cooperation uh, between you and uh, Russian counterparts. Um, that's. Uh, uh, I think uh, a good point, a good positive point to end on on. Uh, the, uh, the, the positive experience everyone's had uh, uh, with the UK-Russian cooperation, that is, of course, the, uh, the main purpose of this uh, entire program, the University Alliance, about promoting that cooperation between Russian and UK universities. So I can't think of a better way to end than on a note of uh, positivity uh, about how productive that is and hope for further uh, cooperation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Edwards, uh, Professor Ford, uh, Dr. Rees, and Dr. Tutabilina, for your presentations. Um, I found them uh, really fascinating. I'm sure others did as well. I hope they uh, inspire further um, uh, reflection, further cooperation, um, and uh, Arctic science is uh, in good hands, it seems. Um, thank you uh, to all of our speakers uh, today again. Um, uh, I think we've had three really uh, uh, really strong discussions, really uh, thought provoking um, and, and also inspiring discussions. Um, I hope that uh, everyone who's joined us, um, both as a participant and uh, uh, as an audience member has enjoyed, their, uh, enjoyed the forum and uh, taken something away from it. Um, this is of course, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, just one in a series of events which are being run as part of the uh, University Alliance program. The next forum is on the 18th of February. Um, the topic is transnational education, uh, joint and dual degrees. So another uh, 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 another session highlighting the benefits and uh, of international cooperation. Uh, registration is available at the uh, UK Russia University Alliance website, uh, which is uk-russia-alliance.ru. Um, to stay up to date with uh, the other climate events activity that we're running uh, as an embassy uh, in the lead up to COP26 in Glasgow this November, please do follow um, the, the uh, British Embassy social media accounts. Uh, that's at UK and Russia on Facebook, Twitter, and uh, the contact here, and at British Embassy Moscow on Instagram, um, where you'll find lots more uh, de uh, details of lots more events uh, just like the, the one today, um, and indeed uh, different formats and uh, different topics as well. Um, also a plea to uh, please fill out the survey when you receive it, you'll receive a link shortly after the forum. Uh, they are really helpful for us in designing the programme and choosing the uh, content of each of our events. Um, that's everything from me today, just a final thank you to all of our audience members, thank you again to all of our speakers, um, and uh, I hope to see you at the, uh, the next event, the uh, University Alliance series. Thank you everyone, goodbye.